Section 15 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger Translated by William Melmoth Revised by F. C. T. Bosenkay This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman Section 15 Letters 97 to 105 Letter 97 To Calvisius I have spent these several days past in reading and writing with the most pleasing tranquillity imaginable. You will ask, how can that possibly be in the midst of Rome? It was the time of celebrating the Circensian Games, an entertainment for which I have not the least taste. They have no novelty, no variety to recommend them, nothing, in short, one would wish to see twice. It does the more surprise me, therefore, that so many thousand people should be possessed with the childish passion of desiring so often to see a parcel of horses gallop and men standing upright in their chariots. If, indeed, it were the swiftness of their horses, or the skill of the men that attracted them, there might be some pretense of reason for it but it is the dress they like, it is the dress that takes their fancy. And if, in the midst of the course and contest, the different parties were to change colours, their different partisans would change sights, and instantly desert the very same men and horses, whom just before they were eagerly following with their eyes, as far as they could see, and shouting out their names with all their might. Such mighty charms, such wondrous power, reside in the colour of a paltry tunic. And this, not only with a common crowd, more contemptible than the dress they espouse, but even with serious-thinking people. When I observe such men thus insatiably fond of so silly, so low, so uninteresting, so common an entertainment, I congratulate myself on my indifference to these pleasures, and am glad to employ the leisure of this season upon my books, which others throw away upon the most idle occupations. Farewell. Letter 98 to Romanus I am pleased to find by your letter that you are engaged in building, for I may now defend my own conduct by your example. I am myself employed in the same sort of work, and since I have you, who shall deny I have reason on my side? Our situations, too, are not dissimilar. Your buildings are carried on upon the sea-coast, mine are rising upon the side of the Larian Lake. I have several villas upon the borders of this lake, but there are two particularly in which, as I take most delight, so they give me most employment. They are both situated like those at Bayai. One of them stands upon a rock and overlooks the lake, the other actually touches it. The first, supported as it were by the lofty buskin, I call my tragic, the other as resting upon the humble rock, my comic villa. Each has its own peculiar charm, recommending it to its possessor so much more on account of this very difference. The former commands a wider, the latter enjoys a nearer view of the lake. One, by a gentle curve, embraces a little bay. The other, being built upon a greater height, forms two. Here you have a straight walk extending itself along the banks of the lake. There, a spacious terrace that falls by a gentle descent towards it. The former does not feel the force of the waves, the latter breaks them. From that you see the fishing vessels. From this you may fish yourself, and throw your line out of your room, and almost from your bed, as from off a boat. It is the beauties, therefore, these agreeable villas possess, that tempt me to add to them those which are wanting. 
but I need not assign a reason to you, who undoubtedly will think it a sufficient one that I follow your example. Farewell. Letter 99. To Geminus. Your letter was particularly acceptable to me, as it mentioned your desire that I would send you something of mine, addressed to you, to insert in your works. I shall find a more appropriate occasion of complying with your request than that which you propose, the subject you point out to me being attended with some objections, and when you reconsider it, you will think so. As I did not imagine there were any booksellers at Lugdunum, I am so much the more pleased to learn that my works are sold there. I rejoice to find they maintain the character abroad which they raised at home, and I begin to flatter myself they have some merit, since persons of such distant countries are agreed in their opinion with regard to them. Farewell. Letter 100 to Junior A certain friend of mine lately chastised his son, in my presence, for being somewhat too expensive in the matter of dogs and horses. And pray, I asked him when the youth had left us, did you never commit a fault yourself which deserved your father's correction? Did you never, I repeat, nay, are you not sometimes even now guilty of errors which your son, were he in your place, might with equal gravity reprove? Are not all mankind subject to indiscretions, and have we not each of us our particular follies in which we fondly indulge ourselves? The great affection I have for you induced me to set this instance of unreasonable severity before you, a caution not to treat your son with too much harshness and severity. Consider, he is but a boy and that there was a time when you were so too. In exerting, therefore, the authority of a father, remember always that you are a man, and the parent of a man. Farewell. Letter 101 To Quadratus The pleasure and attention with which you read the vindication I published of Helvidius has greatly raised your curiosity, it seems, to be informed of those particulars relating to that affair, which are not mentioned in the defence, as you were too young to be present yourself at that transaction. When Domitian was assassinated, a glorious opportunity, I thought, offered itself to me of pursuing the guilty, vindicating the injured, and advancing my own reputation. But amidst an infinite variety of the blackest crimes, none appeared to me more atrocious than that a senator of praetorian dignity and invested with the sacred character of a judge should even in the very senate itself lay violent hands upon a member of that body one of consular rank and who then stood arraigned before him besides this general consideration I also happened to be on terms of particular intimacy with Helvidius, as far as this was possible with one who, through fear of the times, endeavoured to veil the lustre of his fame and his virtues, in obscurity and retirement. Aria likewise, and her daughter Fania, who was mother-in-law to Helvidius, were in the number of my friends. But it was not so much private attachments, as the honour of the public, a just indignation at the action, and the danger of the example if it should pass unpunished, that animated me upon the occasion. At the first restoration of liberty, every man singled out his own particular enemy, though it must be confessed, those only of a lower rank, and, in the midst of much clamour and confusion, no sooner brought the charge than procured the condemnation. But for myself, I thought it would be more reasonable and more effectual not to take advantage of the general resentment of the public, but to crush this criminal with a single weight 
of his own enormous guilt. When, therefore, the first heat of public indignation began to cool, and declining passion gave way to justice, though I was at that time under great affliction for the loss of my wife. I sent to Antea, the widow of Helvidius, and desired her to come to me, as my late misfortune prevented me from appearing in public. When she arrived, I said to her, I am resolved not to suffer the injuries your husband has received to pass unrevenged. Let Aria and Fania, who are just returned from exile, know this, and consider together whether you would care to join with me in the prosecution. Not that I want an associate, but I am not so jealous of my own glory as to refuse to share it with you in this affair. She accordingly carried this message, and they all agreed to the proposal without the least hesitation. It happened very opportunely that the Senate was to meet within three days. It was a general rule with me to consult in all my affairs with Corellius, a person of the greatest far-sightedness and wisdom this age has produced. However, in the present case, I relied entirely upon my own discretion, being apprehensive he would not approve of my design, as he was very cautious and deliberate. But though I did not previously take counsel with him, my experience having taught me never to do so with a person concerning a question we have already determined, where he has a right to expect that one shall be decided by his judgment. Yet I could not forbear acquainting him with my resolution at the time I intended to carry it into execution. The Senate being assembled, I came into the house and begged I might have leave to make a motion which I did in few words, and with general assent. When I began to touch upon the charge, and point out the person I intended to accuse, though as yet without mentioning him by name, I was attacked on all sides. Let us know, exclaims one, who is the subject of this informal motion? Who is it, asked another, that is thus accused, without acquainting the house with his name and his crime? Surely, added a third, we who have survived the late dangerous times may expect now at least to remain in security. I heard all this with perfect calmness, and without being in the least alarmed. Such is the effect of conscious integrity, and so much difference is there with respect to inspiring confidence or fear whether the world had only rather one should forbear a certain act, or absolutely condemn it. It would be too tedious to relate all that was advanced by different parties upon this occasion. At length the consul said, You will be at liberty, Secundus, to propose what you think proper when your turn comes to give your opinion upon the order of the day. I replied, you must allow me a liberty which you never yet refuse to any. And so sat down, when immediately the house went upon another business. In the meanwhile, one of my consular friends took me aside, and, with great earnestness, telling me he thought I had carried on this affair with more boldness than prudence, used every method of reproof and persuasion to prevail with me to desist adding at the same time that I should certainly, if I persevered, render myself obnoxious to some future prince. Be it so, I returned, should he prove a bad one. Scarcely had he left me when a second came up. Whatever, said he, are you attempting? Why ever will you ruin yourself? Do you consider the risks you expose yourself to? Why will you presume too much on the present situation of public affairs when it is so uncertain what turn they may hereafter take? You are attacking a man who is actually at the head of the treasury, and will shortly be consul. 
Besides, recollect what credit he has, and with what powerful friendships he is supported. Upon which he named a certain person who, not without several strong and suspicious rumours, was then at the head of a powerful army in the east. I replied, All I foreseen, and oft in thought revolved, and am willing, if fate shall so decree, to suffer in an honest cause, provided I can draw vengeance down upon a most infamous one. The time for the members to give their opinions was now arrived. Domitius Apollinaris, the consul-elect, spoke first. After him Fabricius Vigento, then Fabius Maximinus, Vettius Proculus next, who married my wife's mother, and who was the colleague of Publicius Curtus, the person on whom the debate turned. And last of all, Amius Flaccus. They all defended Curtus, as if I had named him, though I had not yet so much as once mentioned him, and entered upon his justification as if I had exhibited a specific charge. It is not necessary to repeat in this place what they respectively said, having given it all at length in their words in the speech above mentioned. Avidius Quietus and Cornutus Tertullus answered them, the former observed that it was extremely unjust not to hear the complaints of those who thought themselves injured, and therefore that Aria and Fania ought not to be denied the privilege of laying their grievances before the house, and that the point for the consideration of the Senate was not the rank of the person, but the merit of the cause. Then Cornutus rose up and acquainted the house that, as he was appointed guardian to the daughter of Helvidius by the consuls, upon the petition of her mother and her father-in-law, he felt himself compelled to fulfil the duty of his trust, in the execution of which, however, he would endeavour to set some bounds to his indignation, by following that great example of moderation which those excellent women had set who contented themselves with barely informing the Senate of the cruelties which Curtus committed in order to carry on his infamous adulation. And therefore, he said, he would move only that, if a punishment due to a crime so notoriously known should be remitted, Curtus might at least be branded with some mark of the displeasure of that august assembly. Satrius Rufus spoke next, and, meaning to steer a middle course, expressed himself with considerable ambiguity. I am of opinion, said he, that great injustice will be done to Curtus if he is not acquitted, for I do not scruple to mention his name, since the friends of Aria and Fania, as well as his own, have done so too nor indeed have we any occasion for anxiety upon this account. We who think well of the man shall judge him with the same impartiality as the rest. But if he is innocent, as I hope he is, and shall be glad to find, I think this house may very justly deny the present motion, till some charge has been proved against him. Thus, according to the respective order in which they were called upon, they delivered their several opinions. When it came to my turn, I rose up and, using the same introduction to my speech as I have published in the defence, I replied to them severally. It is surprising with what attention, what clamorous applause I was heard, even by those who just before were loudest against me. Such a wonderful change was wrought, either by the importance of the affair, the successful progress of the speech, or the resolution of the advocate. After I had finished, Vigento attempted to reply, but the general clamour raised against him not permitting him to go on. I entreat you, conscript fathers, 
said he, not to oblige me to implore the assistance of the tribunes. Immediately the tribune Morina cried out, You have my permission, most illustrious Vigento, to go on. But still the clamour was renewed. In the interval, the consul ordered the house to divide, and having counted the voices, dismissed the senate, leaving Vigento in the midst, still attempting to speak. He made great complaints of this affront, as he called it, applying the following lines of Homer to himself. Great perils, father, wait the unequal fight. Those younger champions will thy strength o'ercome. There was hardly a man in the Senate that did not embrace and kiss me, and all strove who should applaud me most for having, at the cost of private enmities, revived a custom so long disused of freely consulting the Senate upon affairs that concern the honour of the public. In a word, for having wiped off that reproach which was thrown upon it by other orders in the state, that the senators mutually favoured the members of their own body, while they were very severe in animadverting upon the rest of their fellow citizens. All this was transacted in the absence of Curtis, who kept out of the way either because he suspected something of this nature was intended to be moved, or, as was alleged in his excuse, that he was really unwell. Caesar, however, did not refer the examination of this matter to the Senate, but I succeeded, nevertheless, in my aim, another person being appointed to succeed Curtis in the consulship, while the election of his colleague to that office was confirmed. And thus, the wish with which I concluded my speech was actually accomplished. May he be obliged, said I, to renounce, under a virtuous prince, that reward he received from an infamous one. Some time after I recollected, as well as I could, the speech I had made upon this occasion, to which I made several additions. It happened, though indeed it had the appearance of being something more than casual, that a few days after I had published this piece, Curtis was taken ill and died. I was told that his imagination was continually haunted with this affair, and kept picturing me ever before his eyes, as a man pursuing him with a drawn sword. Whether there was any truth in this rumour, I will not venture to assert, but, for the sake of example, however, I could wish it might gain credit. And now I have sent you a letter which, considering it is a letter, is as long as the defence you say you have read. But you must thank yourself for not being content with such information as that piece could afford you. Farewell. Letter 102 to Genitor I have received your letter in which you complain of having been highly disgusted lately at a very splendid entertainment by a set of buffoons, mummers, and wanton prostitutes who are dancing about round the tables. But let me advise you to smooth your knitted brows somewhat. I confess, indeed, I admit nothing of this kind at my own house. However, I bear with it in others. And why, then, you'll be ready to ask, not have them yourself? The truth is, because the gestures of the wanton, the pleasantries of the buffoon, or the extravagancies of the mummer, give me no pleasure, as they give me no surprise. It is my particular taste, you see not my judgment that I plead against them. 
and indeed what numbers are there who think the entertainments with which you and I are most delighted no better than impertinent follies? How many are there who, as soon as a reader, a lyrist, or a comedian is introduced, either take their leave of the company or, if they remain, show as much dislike to this sort of thing as you did to those monsters, as you call them. Let us bear, therefore, my friend, with others in their amusements, that they, in return, may show indulgence to ours. Farewell. Letter 103 To Sabinianus Your freedman, whom you lately mentioned to me with displeasure, has been with me, and threw himself at my feet with as much submission as he could have fallen at yours. He earnestly requested me with many tears, and even with all the eloquence of silent sorrow, to intercede for him. In short, he convinced me by his whole behaviour that he sincerely repents of his fault. I am persuaded he is thoroughly reformed, because he seems deeply sensible of his guilt. I know you are angry with him, and I know too it is not without reason. But clemency can never exert itself more laudably than when there is the most cause for resentment. You once had an affection for this man, and, I hope, will have again. Meanwhile, let me only prevail with you to pardon him. If he should incur your displeasure hereafter, you will have so much the stronger plea in excuse for your anger, as you show yourself more merciful to him now. Concede something to his youth, to his tears, and to your own natural mildness of temper. Do not make him uneasy any longer. And I will add, too, do not make yourself so. For a man of your kindness of heart cannot be angry without feeling great uneasiness. I am afraid, were I to join my entreaties with his, I should seem rather to compel than request you to forgive him. Yet I will not scruple even to write mine with his and in so much the stronger terms as I have very sharply and severely reproved him, positively threatening never to interpose again in his behalf. But though it was proper to say this to him, in order to make him more fearful of offending, I do not say so to you. I may, perhaps, again have occasion to entreat you upon this account and again obtain your forgiveness. Supposing, I mean, his fault should be such as may become me to intercede for, and you to pardon. Farewell. Letter 104 to Maximus It has frequently happened, as I have been pleading before the court of the hundred, that these venerable judges, after having preserved for a long period the gravity and solemnity suitable to their character, have suddenly, as though urged by irresistible impulse, risen up to a man and applauded me. I have often likewise gained as much glory in the Senate as my utmost wishes could desire, but I never felt a more sensible pleasure than by an account which I lately received from Cornelius Tacitus. He informed me that, at the last Circensian games, he sat next to a Roman knight, who, after conversation had passed between them upon various points of learning, asked him, Are you an Italian or a provincial? Tacitus replied, Your acquaintance with literature must surely have informed you who I am. Pray then, is it Tacitus or Pliny I am talking with? I cannot express 
how highly I am pleased to find that our names are not so much the proper appellatives of men as a kind of distinction for learning herself, and that eloquence renders us known to those who would otherwise be ignorant of us. An accident of the same kind happened to me a few days ago. Fabius Rufinus, a person of distinguished merit, was placed next to me at table, and below him a countryman of his, who had just then come to Rome for the first time. Rufinus, calling his friend's attention to me, said to him, You see this man? and entered into a conversation upon the subject of my pursuits, to whom the other immediately replied, This must undoubtedly be Pliny. To confess the truth, I look upon these instances as a very considerable recompense of my labours. If Demosthenes had reason to be pleased with the old woman of Athens crying out, This is Demosthenes, may not I, then, be allowed to congratulate myself upon the celebrity my name has acquired? Yes, my friend, I will rejoice in it, and without scruple admit that I do. As I only mention the judgment of others, not my own, I am not afraid of incurring the censure of vanity, especially from you who, whilst envying no man's reputation, are particularly zealous for mine. Farewell. Letter 105 to Sabinianus I greatly approve of your having, in compliance with my letter, received again into your favour and family a discarded freedman, who you once admitted into a share of your affection. This will afford you, I doubt not, great satisfaction. It certainly has me, both as a proof that your passion can be controlled, and as an instance of your paying so much regard to me as either to yield to my authority or to comply with my request. Let me, therefore, at once both praise and thank you. At the same time, I must advise you to be disposed for the future to pardon the faults of your people, though there should be none to intercede in their behalf. Farewell. End of section 15「Section 16 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger, translated by William Melmoth, revised by F. C. T. Bosanquet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Letters 106 to 110. Letter 106 to Lupicus. I said once, and I think not inaptly, of a certain orator of the present age, whose compositions are extremely regular and correct, but deficient in grandeur and embellishment. His only fault is that he has none. Whereas he, who is possessed of the true spirit of oratory, should be bold and elevated, and sometimes even flame out, be hurried away, and frequently tread upon the brink of a precipice, for danger is generally near whatever is towering and exalted. The plain, it is true, affords a safer, but for that reason a more humble and inglorious path. They who run are more likely to stumble than they who creep, but the latter gain no honour by not slipping, while the former even fall with glory. It is with eloquence, as with some other arts. She is never more pleasing than when she risks most. Have you not observed what acclamations our rope-dancers excite at the instant of imminent danger? Whatever is most entirely unexpected, or as the Greeks more strongly express it, whatever is most perilous, most excites our admiration. The pilot's skill is by no means equally proved in a calm as in a storm, 
in the former case he tamely enters the port, unnoticed and unapplauded, but when the cordage cracks, the mast bends, and the rudder groans, then it is that he shines out in all his glory, and is hailed as little inferior to a sea-god. The reason of my making this observation is, because if I mistake not, you have marked some passages in my writings for being tumid, exuberant, and overwrought, which, in my estimation, are but adequate to the thought, or boldly sublime. But it is material to consider whether your criticism turns upon such points as are real faults, or only striking and remarkable expressions. Whatever is elevated, is sure to be observed, but it requires a very nice judgment to distinguish the bounds between true and false grandeur, between loftiness and exaggeration. To give an instance out of Homer, the author who can, with the greatest propriety, fly from one extreme of style to another, Heaven in loud thunder bids the trumpet sound, and wide beneath them groans the rending ground. Again, reclined on clouds his steed and armour lay. So in this passage, as torrents roll, increased by numerous rills, with rage impetuous down their echoing hills, rushed to the vales, and poured along the plain, roar through a thousand channels to the main. It requires, I say, the nicest balance to poise these metaphors, and determine whether they are incredible and meaningless, or majestic and sublime. Not that I think anything which I have written, or can write, admits of comparison with these. I am not quite so foolish, but what I would be understood to contend for is that we should give eloquence free rein and not restrain the force and impetuosity of genius within too narrow a compass. But it will be said, perhaps, that one law applies to orators, another to poets, as if, in truth, Mark Tully were not as bold in his metaphors as any of the poets. But not to mention particular instances from him, in a point where, I imagine, there can be no dispute. Does Demosthenes himself, that model and standard of true oratory, does Demosthenes check and repress the fire of his indignation in that well-known passage which begins thus, These wicked men, these flatterers, and these destroyers of mankind, etc.? And again, it is neither with stones nor bricks that I have fortified this city, etc. And afterwards, I have thrown up these outworks before Attica, and pointed out to you all the resources which human prudence can suggest, etc. And in another place, O Athenians, I swear by the immortal gods that he is intoxicated with the grandeur of his own actions, etc. But what can be more daring and beautiful than that long digression which begins in this manner a terrible disease? The following passage likewise, though somewhat shorter, is equally boldly conceived. Then it was I rose up in opposition to the daring Pytho, who poured forth a torrent of menaces against you, etc., the subsequent stricture is of the same stamp. When a man has strengthened himself, as Philip has, in avarice and wickedness, the first pretense, the first false step, be it ever so inconsiderable, has overthrown and destroyed all, etc. So in the same style with the foregoing is this. Railed off, as it were, from the privileges of society, by the concurrent and just judgments of the three tribunals in the city, and in the same place, O Aristogiton, 
you have betrayed that mercy which used to be shown to offences of this nature, or rather, indeed, you have wholly destroyed it. In vain, then, would you fly for refuge to a port, which you have shut up and encompassed with rocks. He has said before, I am afraid, therefore, you should appear in the judgment of some to have erected a public seminary of faction, for there is a weakness in all wickedness which renders it apt to betray itself. And a little lower, I see none of these resources open to him, but all is precipice gulf and profound abyss. And again, nor do I imagine that our ancestors erected those courts of judicature, that men of his character should be planted there, but on the contrary eradicated, that none may emulate their evil actions. And afterwards, if he is then the artificer of every wickedness, if he only makes it his trade and traffic, etc., and a thousand other passages which I might cite to the same purpose, not to mention those expressions which Aeschines calls not words, but wonders. You will tell me, perhaps, I have unwarily mentioned Aeschines, since Demosthenes is condemned even by him for running into these figurative expressions. But observe, I entreat you, how far superior the former orator is to his critic and superior to in the very passage to which he objects for in others the force of his genius in those above quoted its loftiness makes itself manifest but does aeschines himself avoid those errors which he reproves in demosthenes the orator says he athenians and the law ought to speak the same language but when the voice of the law declares one thing, and that of the orator another, we should give our vote to the justice of the law, not to the impudence of the orator. And in another place, he afterwards manifestly discovered the design he had, of concealing his fraud under cover of the decree, having expressly declared therein that the ambassadors sent to the Oritae gave the five talents not to you, but to Callias, and that you may be convinced of the truth of what I say, after having stripped the decree of its galleys, its trim and its arrogant ostentation, the clause itself. And in another part, suffer him not to break cover and escape out of the limits of the question a metaphor he is so fond of that he repeats it again, but remaining firm and confident in the assembly, drive him into the merits of the question, and observe well how he doubles. Is his style more reserved and simple when he says, but you are ever wounding our ears, and are more concerned in the success of your daily harangues than for the salvation of the city? What follows is conceived in a yet higher strain of metaphor. Will you not expel this man as the common calamity of Greece? Will you not seize and punish this pirate of the state, who sails about in quest of favourable conjunctures, etc.? With many other passages of a similar nature. And now, I expect, you will make the same attacks upon certain expressions in this letter, as you did upon those I have been endeavouring to defend, the rudder that groans, and the pilot compared to a sea-god, will not, I imagine, escape your criticism. For I perceive, while I am suing for indulgence to my former style, I have fallen into the same kind of figurative diction which you condemn. But attack them, if you please, provided you will immediately appoint a day when we may meet to discuss these matters in person. You will then either teach me to be less daring, or I shall teach you to be more bold. Farewell. Letter 107 To Caninius I have met with a story which, although authenticated by undoubted evidence, looks very like fable, 
and would afford a worthy field for the exercise of so exuberant, lofty, and truly poetical a genius as your own. It was related to me the other day over the dinner-table, where the conversation happened to run upon various kinds of marvels. The person who told the story was a man of unsuspected veracity. But what has a poet to do with truth? However, you might venture to rely upon his testimony, even though you had the character of a faithful historian to support. There is in Africa a town called Hippo, situated not far from the sea coast. It stands upon a navigable lake, communicating with an estuary in the form of a river, which alternately flows into the lake, or into the ocean, according to the ebb and flow of the tide. People of all ages amuse themselves here with fishing, sailing, or swimming, especially boys, whom love of play brings to the spot. With these, it is a fine and manly achievement to be able to swim the furthest, and he that leaves the shore and his companions at the greatest distance gains the victory. It happened, in one of these trials of skill, that a certain boy, bolder than the rest, launched out towards the opposite shore. He was met by a dolphin, who sometimes swam before him, and sometimes behind him, then played round him, and at last took him upon his back, and set him down, and afterwards took him up again, and thus he carried the poor frightened fellow out into the deepest part, when immediately he turns back again to the shore, and lands him among his companions. The fame of this remarkable accident spread through the town, and crowds of people flocked round the boy, whom they viewed as a kind of prodigy, to ask him questions, and hear him relate the story. The next day the shore was thronged with spectators, all attentively watching the ocean, and, what indeed is almost itself an ocean, the lake. Meanwhile, the boy swam as usual, and among the rest, the boy I am speaking of, went into the lake, but with more caution than before. The dolphin appeared again, and came to the boy, who, together with his companions, swam away with the utmost precipitation. The dolphin, as though to invite and call them back, leaped and dived up and down in a series of circular movements. This he practised the next day, the day after, and for several days together, till the people, accustomed from their infancy to the sea, began to be ashamed of their timidity. They ventured, therefore, to advance nearer, playing with him and calling him to them, while he, in return, suffered himself to be touched and stroked. Use rendered them courageous. The boy, in particular, who first made the experiment, swam by the side of him, and leaping upon his back, was carried backwards and forwards in that manner, and thought the dolphin knew him, and was fond of him while he too had grown fond of the dolphin. There seemed now, indeed, to be no fear on either side. The confidence of the one, and the tameness of the other mutually increasing, the rest of the boys in the meanwhile, surrounding and encouraging their companion. It is very remarkable that this dolphin was followed by a second, which seemed only as a spectator and attendant on the former, for he did not at all submit to the same familiarities as the first, but only escorted him backwards and forwards, as the boys did their comrade. But what is further surprising, and no less true than what I have already related, is that this dolphin, who thus played with the boys and carried them upon his back, would come upon the shore, dry himself in the sand, and, as soon as he grew warm, roll back into the sea. It is a fact that Octavius Avitus, deputy governor of the province, actuated by an absurd piece of superstition, poured some ointment over him as he lay on the shore, 
the novelty and smell of which made him retire into the ocean, and it was not till several days after that he was seen again, when he appeared dull and languid. However, he recovered his strength and continued his usual playful tricks. All the magistrates round flocked hither to view this sight, whose arrival and prolonged stay was an additional expense, which the slender finances of this little community would ill afford. Besides, the quiet and retirement of the place was utterly destroyed. It was thought proper, therefore, to remove the occasion of this concourse by privately killing the poor dolphin. And now, with what a flow of tenderness will you describe this affecting catastrophe? And how will your genius adorn and heighten this moving story? Though, indeed, the subject does not require any fictitious embellishments, it will be sufficient to describe the actual facts of the case without suppression or diminution. Farewell. Letter 108 to Fuscus You want to know how I portion out my day in my summer villa at Tuscum. I get up just when I please, generally about sunrise, often earlier, but seldom later than this. I keep the shutters closed, as darkness and silence wonderfully promote meditation. Thus free and abstracted from these outward objects which dissipate attention, I am left to my own thoughts, nor suffer my mind to wander with my eyes, but keep my eyes in subjection to my mind, which, when they are not distracted by a multiplicity of external objects, see nothing but what the imagination represents to them. If I have any work in hand, this is the time I choose for thinking it out, word for word, even to the minutest accuracy of expression. In this way, I compose more or less, according as the subject is more or less difficult, and I find myself able to retain it. I then call my secretary, and opening the shutters, dictate to him what I have put into shape, after which I dismiss him, then call him in again, and again dismiss him. About ten or eleven o'clock, for I do not observe one fixed hour, according to the weather, I either walk upon my terrace or in the covered portico, and there I continue to meditate or dictate what remains upon the subject in which I am engaged. This completed, I get into my chariot, where I employ myself as before, when I was walking, or in my study, and find this change of scene refreshes and keeps up my attention. On my return home, I take a little nap, then a walk, and after that repeat out loud and distinctly some Greek or Latin speech, not so much for the sake of strengthening my voice as my digestion, though indeed the voice at the same time is strengthened by this practice. I then take another walk, am anointed, do my exercises, and go into the bath. At supper, if I have only my wife or a few friends with me, some author is read to us, and after supper we are entertained either with music or an interlude. When that is finished, I take my walk with my family, among whom I am not without some scholars. Thus we pass our evenings in varied conversation, and the day, even when at the longest, steals imperceptibly away. Upon some occasions I change the order in certain of the articles above mentioned. For instance, if I have studied longer or walked more than usual, after my second sleep, and reading a speech or two aloud, instead of using my chariot, I get on horseback by which means I ensure as much exercise, and lose less time. The visits of my friends from the neighbouring villages claim some part of the day, and sometimes, by an agreeable interruption, they come in very seasonably to relieve me when I am feeling tired. I now and then amuse myself with hunting, but always take my tablets into the field, that, 
if I should meet with no game, I may at least bring home something. Part of my time, too, though not so much as they desire, is allotted to my tenants, whose rustic complaints, along with these city occupations, make my literary studies still more delightful to me. Farewell. Letter 109 to Paulinus As you are not of a disposition to expect from your friends the ordinary ceremonial observances of society, when they cannot observe them without inconvenience to themselves, so I love you too steadfastly to be apprehensive of your taking otherwise than I wish you should, my not waiting upon you on the first day of your entrance upon the consular office especially as I am detained here by the necessity of letting my farms upon long leases. I am obliged to enter upon an entirely new plan with my tents, for under the former leases, though I made them very considerable abatements, they have run greatly in arrear. For this reason several of them have not only taken no sort of care to lessen a debt which they found themselves incapable of wholly discharging, but have even seized and consumed all the produce of the land, in the belief that it would now be of no advantage to themselves to spare it. I must, therefore, obviate this increasing evil, and endeavour to find out some remedy against it. The only one I can think of is, not to reserve my rent in money, but in kind, and so place some of my servants to overlook the tillage, and guard the stock, as indeed there is no sort of revenue more agreeable to reason than what arises from the bounty of the soil, the seasons, and the climate. It is true this method will require great honesty, sharp eyes, and many hands. However, I must risk the experiment, and, as in an inveterate complaint, try every change of remedy. You see, it is not any pleasurable indulgence that prevents my attending you on the first day of your consulship. I shall celebrate it, nevertheless, as much as if I were present, and pay my vows for you here, with all the warmest tokens of joy and congratulation. Farewell. Letter 110 To Fuscus you are much pleased, I find, with the account I gave you in my former letter of how I spend the summer season at Tuscum, and desire to know what alteration I make in my method when I am at Laurentum in the winter. None at all, except abridging myself of my sleep at noon, and borrowing a good piece of the night before daybreak and after sunset for study. And if business is very urgent, which in winter very frequently happens. Instead of having interludes or music after supper, I reconsider whatever I have previously dictated, and improve my memory at the same time by this frequent mental revision. Thus I have given you a general sketch of my mode of life in summer and winter, to which you may add the intermediate seasons of spring and autumn, in which while losing nothing out of the day, I gain but little from the night. Farewell. End of section 16。section 17 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger, translated by William Melmoth, revised by F. C. T. Bosanquet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 17 Part 2 Correspondence with the Emperor Trajan Letters 1 to 27 Letter 1 To the Emperor Trajan The pious affection you bore, most sacred emperor, to your august father, induced you to wish it might be late ere you succeeded him. But the immortal gods thought proper to hasten the advancement of those virtues, 
to the helm of the commonwealth, which had already shared in the steerage. May you then, and the world through your means, enjoy every prosperity worthy of your reign, to which let me add my wishes, most excellent emperor, upon a private as well as public account, that your health and spirits may be preserved, firm and unbroken. Letter 2. To the Emperor Trajan. You have occasioned me, sir, an inexpressible pleasure in deeming me worthy of enjoying the privilege which the laws confer on those who have three children. For although it was from an indulgence to the request of the excellent Julius Servianus, your own most devoted servant, that you granted this favour, yet I have the satisfaction to find by the words of your rescript that you complied the more willingly as his application was in my behalf. I cannot but look upon myself as in possession of my utmost wish, after having thus received, at the beginning of your most auspicious reign, so distinguishing a mark of your peculiar favour, at the same time that it considerably heightens my desire of leaving a family behind me. I was not entirely without this desire, even in the late most unhappy times as my two marriages will induce you to believe. But the gods decreed it better, by reserving every valuable privilege to the bounty of your generous dispensations. And indeed, the pleasure of being a father will be so much more acceptable to me now, that I can enjoy it in full security and happiness. Letter 3. To the Emperor Trajan. The experience, most excellent emperor, I have had of your unbounded generosity to me in my own person, encourages me to hope I may be yet further obliged to it, in that of my friends. Voconius Romanus, who was my schoolfellow and companion from our earliest years, claims the first rank in that number, in consequence of which I petitioned your sacred father to promote him to the dignity of the senatorial order. But the completion of my request is reserved to your goodness, for his mother had not then advanced, in the manner the law directs, the liberal gift of four hundred thousand sesterces, which she engaged to give him in her letter to the late emperor, your father. This, however, by my advice she has since done, having made over certain estates to him, as well as completed every other act necessary to make the conveyance valid. The difficulties therefore being removed which deferred the gratification of our wishes, it is with full confidence I venture to assure you of the worth of my friend Romanus, heightened and adorned as it is not only by liberal culture, but by his extraordinary tenderness to his parents as well. It is to that virtue he owes the present liberality of his mother, as well as his immediate succession to his late father's estate, and his adoption by his father-in-law. To these personal qualifications, the wealth and rank of his family give additional lustre, and I persuade myself it will be some further recommendation that I solicit in his behalf. Let me then entreat you, sir, to enable me to congratulate Romanus on so desirable an occasion, and at the same time to indulge an eager and, I hope, laudable ambition, of having it in my power to boast that your favourable regards are extended not only to myself, but also to my friend. Letter 4. To the Emperor Trajan. When, by your gracious indulgence, sir, I was appointed to preside at the treasury of Saturn, I immediately renounced all engagements of the bar, as indeed I never blended business of that kind with the functions of the state, that no avocations might call off my attention from the post to which I was appointed. For this reason, when the province of Africa petitioned the Senate that I might undertake their cause against Marius Priscus, 
I excused myself from that office, and my excuse was allowed. But when afterwards the consul-elect proposed that the senate should apply to us again, and endeavour to prevail with us to yield to its inclinations, and suffer our names to be thrown into the urn, I thought it most agreeable to that tranquillity and good order which so happily distinguishes your times not to oppose, especially in so reasonable an instance, the will of that august assembly. And, as I am desirous that all my words and actions may receive the sanction of your exemplary virtue, I hope you approve of my compliance. Letter 5. Trajan to Pliny. You acted as became a good citizen and a worthy senator by paying obedience to the just requisition of that august assembly and i have full confidence you will faithfully discharge the business you have undertaken letter six to the emperor trajan having been attacked last year by a very severe and dangerous illness i employed a physician whose care and diligence sir i cannot sufficiently reward but by your gracious assistance i entreat you therefore to make him a denizen of rome for as he is the freedman of a foreign lady he is consequently himself also a foreigner his name is harpercras his patroness who has been dead a considerable time was thermuthis the daughter of theon i further entreat you to bestow the full privileges of a roman citizen upon hedia and antonia harmaris the freedwomen of Antonia Maximilla, a lady of great merit. It is at her desire I make this request. Letter 7. To the Emperor Trajan. I return you thanks, sir, for your ready compliance with my desire in granting the complete privileges of a Roman to the freedwomen of a lady to whom I am allied, and also for making Harpocras, my physician, a denizen of rome but when agreeably to your directions i gave in an account of his age and estate i was informed by those who are better skilled in the affairs than i pretend to be that as he is an egyptian i ought first to have obtained for him the freedom of alexandria before he was made free of rome Indeed, as I was ignorant of any difference in this case between those of Egypt and other countries, I contented myself with only acquainting you that he had been manumitted by a foreign lady long since deceased. However, it is an ignorance I cannot regret, since it affords me an opportunity of receiving from you a double obligation in favour of the same person that i may legally therefore enjoy the benefit of your goodness i beg you would be pleased to grant him the freedom of the city of alexandria as well as that of rome and that your gracious intentions may not meet with any further obstacles i have taken care as you directed to send an account to your freedman of his age and possessions letter eight Trajan to Pliny. It is my resolution, in pursuance of the maxim observed by the princes my predecessors, to be extremely cautious in granting the freedom of the city of Alexandria. However, since you have obtained of me the freedom of Rome for your physician Harpocras, I cannot refuse you this other request. You must let me know to what district he belongs that I may give you a letter to my friend Pompeius Planter, governor of Egypt. Letter 9. To the Emperor Trajan. I cannot express, sir, the pleasure your letter gave me, by which I am informed that you have made my physician Harpocras a denizen of Alexandria, notwithstanding your resolution to follow the maxim of your predecessors in this point, by being extremely cautious in granting that privilege agreeably to your directions i acquaint you that harpocras belongs to the district of memphis i entreat you then most gracious emperor to send me as you promised a letter to your friend pompeius planter governor of egypt as i purpose 
in order to have the earliest enjoyment of your presence so ardently wished for here, to come to meet you, I beg, sir, you would permit me to extend my journey as far as possible. Letter 10. To the Emperor Trajan. I was greatly obliged, sir, in my late illness, to Posthumius Marinus, my physician, and I cannot make him a suitable return, but by the assistance of your wonted gracious indulgence. I entreat you then to make Chrysippus Mithridates, and his wife Stratonica, who are related to Marinus, denizens of Rome. I entreat likewise the same privilege in favour of Epigonus, and Mithridates, the two sons of Chrysippus, but with this restriction, that they may remain under the dominion of their father, and yet reserve their right of patronage over their own freedmen. I further entreat you to grant the full privileges of a Roman to Lucius Satrius Abascantius, Publius Caesius Phosphorus, and Pancharia Soteris. This request I make with the consent of their patrons. Letter 11. To the Emperor Trajan. After your late sacred father, sir, had, in a noble speech as well as by his own generous example, exhorted and encouraged the public to acts of munificence, I implored his permission to remove the several statues which I had of the former emperors to my corporation, and at the same time requested permission to add his own to the number. For as I had hitherto let them remain in the respective places in which they stood when they were left to me by several different inheritances, they were dispersed in distant parts of my estate. He was pleased to grant my request, and at the same time to give me a very ample testimony of his approbation. I immediately, therefore, wrote to the decurii to desire they would allot a piece of ground upon which I might build a temple at my own expense, and they, as a mark of honour to my design, offered me the choice of any site I might think proper. However, my own ill health in the first place and later that of your father, together with the duties of that employment which you were both pleased to entrust me, prevented my proceeding with that design. But I have now, I think, a convenient opportunity of making an excursion for the purpose, as my monthly attendances ends on the 1st of September, and there are several festivals in the month following. My first request, then, is that you would permit me to adorn the temple I am going to erect with your statue, and next, in order to the execution of my design with all the expedition possible, that you would indulge me with leave of absence. It would ill become the sincerity I profess were I to dissemble that your goodness in complying with this desire will at the same time be extremely serviceable to me in my own private affairs. It is absolutely necessary I should not defer any longer the letting of my lands in that province, for besides that they amount to above four hundred thousand sesterces, the time for dressing the vineyards is approaching, and that business must fall upon my new tenants. The unfruitfulness of the seasons besides, for several years past, obliges me to think of making some abatements in my rents which I cannot possibly settle unless I am present. I shall be indebted, then, to your indulgence, sir, for the expedition of my work of piety, and the settlement of my own private affairs, if you will be pleased to grant me leave of absence for thirty days. I cannot give myself a shorter time, as the town and the estate of which I am speaking lie above a hundred and fifty miles from Rome. Letter twelve. Trajan to Pliny. You have given me many private reasons, and every public one, why you desire leave of absence. But I need no other than that it is your desire, and I doubt not of your returning as soon as possible to the duty of an office which so much requires your attendance. As I would not seem to check any instance of your affection towards me, I shall not oppose your erecting my statue in the place you desire, though in general 
I am extremely cautious in giving any encouragement to honours of that kind. Letter 13. To the Emperor Trajan. As I am sensible, sir, that the highest applause my actions can receive is to be distinguished by so excellent a prince, I beg you would be graciously pleased to add either the office of Augur or Septemvir, both which are now vacant, to the dignity I already enjoy by your indulgence, that I may have the satisfaction of publicly offering up those vows for your prosperity from the duty of my office, which I daily prefer to the gods in private, from the affection of my heart. Letter 14. To the Emperor Trajan. Having safely passed the promontory of Malia, I am arrived at Ephesus with all my retinue, notwithstanding I was detained for some time by contrary winds, a piece of information, sir, in which, I trust, you will feel yourself concerned. I propose pursuing the remainder of my journey to the province, partly in light vessels, and partly in post-chaises, for as the excessive heats will prevent my travelling altogether by land, so the Etesian winds, which are now set in, will not permit me to proceed entirely by sea. Letter 15. Trajan to Pliny. Your information, my dear Pliny, was extremely agreeable to me as it does concern me to know in what manner you arrive at your province. It is a wise intention of yours to travel either by sea or land, as you shall find most convenient. Letter 16. To the Emperor Trajan. As I had a very favourable voyage to Ephesus, so in travelling by post chaise from thence I was extremely troubled by the heats, and also by some slight feverish attacks, which kept me some time at Pergamus. From there, sir, I got on board a coasting vessel, but being again detained by contrary winds, did not arrive at Bithynia so soon as I had hoped. However, I have no reason to complain of this delay, since, which indeed was the most auspicious circumstance that could attend me, I reached the province in time to celebrate your birthday. I am at present engaged in examining the finances of the Prusenses their expenses, revenues, and credits, and the further I proceed in this work, the more I am convinced of the necessity of my inquiry. Several large sums of money are owing to the city from private persons, which they neglect to pay upon various pretenses, as, on the other hand, I find the public funds are, in some instances, very unwarrantably applied. This, sir, I write to you immediately on my arrival. I entered this province on the 17th of September, and found in it that obedience and loyalty towards yourself which you justly merit from all mankind. You will consider, sir, whether it would not be proper to send a surveyor here, for I am inclined to think much might be deducted from what is charged by those who have the conduct of the public works, if a faithful admeasurement were to be taken. At least, I am of that opinion from what I have already seen of the accounts of this city, which I am now going into as fully as is possible. Letter 17. Trajan to Pliny. I should have rejoiced to have heard that you arrived at Bithynia without the smallest inconvenience to yourself or any of your retinue, and that your journey from Ephesus had been as easy as your voyage to that place was favourable. For the rest... Your letter informs me, my dearest Secundus, on what day you reached Bithynia. The people of that province will be convinced, I persuade myself, that I am attentive to their interest, as your conduct towards them will make it manifest that I could have chosen no more proper person to supply my place. The examination of the public accounts ought certainly to be your first employment, as they are evidently in great disorder, I have scarcely surveyors sufficient to inspect those works which I am carrying on at Rome and in the neighbourhood, but persons of integrity and skill in this art may be found most certainly in every province, so that they will not fail you if only you will make due inquiry. Letter 18. To the Emperor Trajan. Though I am well assured, sir, 
that you, who never omit any opportunity of exerting your generosity, are not unmindful of the request I lately made to you. Yet, as you have often indulged me in this manner, give me leave to remind and earnestly entreat you to bestow the praetorship now vacant upon Atius Sura. Though his ambition is extremely moderate, yet the quality of his birth, the inflexible integrity he has preserved in a very narrow fortune, and more than all the felicity of your times, which encourages conscious virtue to claim your favour, induce him to hope he may experience it in the present instance. Letter 19. To the Emperor Trajan. I congratulate both you and the public, most excellent Emperor, upon the great and glorious victory you have obtained, so agreeable to the heroism of ancient Rome. May the immortal gods grant the same happy success to all your designs, that, under the administration of so many princely virtues, the splendour of the empire may shine out, not only in its former, but with additional lustre. Letter 20. To the Emperor Trajan. My Lieutenant Servilius Pudence came to Nicomedia, sir, on the 24th of November, and by his arrival freed me, at length, from the anxiety of a very uneasy expectation. Letter 21. To the Emperor Trajan. Your generosity to me, sir, was the occasion of uniting me to Rosianus Geminus by the strongest ties, for he was my quaestor when I was consul. His behaviour to me during the continuance of our offices was highly respectful, and he has treated me ever since with so peculiar a regard that, besides the many obligations I owe him, upon a public account, I am indebted to him for the strongest pledges of private friendship. I entreat you, then, to comply with my request for the advancement of one whom, if my recommendation has any weight, you will even distinguish with your particular favour, and whatever trust you shall repose in him, he will endeavour to show himself still deserving of an higher. But I am the more sparing in my praises of him, being persuaded his integrity, his probity, and his vigilance are well known to you, not only from those high posts which he has exercised in Rome within your immediate inspection, but from his behaviour when he served unto you in the army. One thing, however, my affection for him inclines me to think I have not yet sufficiently done, and therefore, sir, I repeat my entreaties that you will give me the pleasure, as early as possible, of rejoicing in the advancement of my quaestor, or, in other words, of receiving an addition to my own honours in the person of my friend. Letter 22. To the Emperor Trajan. It is not easy, sir, to express the joy I received when I heard you had, in compliance with the request of my mother-in-law and myself, granted Coelius Clemens the proconsulship of this province after the expiration of his consular office. As it is from thence I learn the full extent of your goodness towards me, which thus graciously extends itself through my whole family. As I dare not pretend to make an equal return to those obligations I so justly owe you, I can only have recourse to vows, and ardently implore the gods that I may not be found unworthy of those favours which you are the repeatedly conferring upon me. Letter 23. To the Emperor Trajan. I received, sir, a dispatch from your freedman Lycormus, desiring me, if any embassy from Bosporus should come here on the way to Rome, that I would detain it till his arrival. None has yet arrived, at least in the city where I now am. But a courier passing through this place from the king of Sarmatia, I embrace the opportunity which accidentally offers itself, of sending with him the messenger which Lycormus dispatched hither, that you might be informed by both their letters of what, perhaps, it may be expedient you should be acquainted with at one and the same time. Letter 24. To the Emperor Trajan. 
I am informed by a letter from the King of Sarmatia that there are certain affairs of which you ought to be informed as soon as possible. In order, therefore, to hasten the dispatches which his courier was charged with to you, I granted him an order to make use of the public post. Letter 25. To the Emperor Trajan. The ambassador from the King of Sarmatia having remained two days by his own choice at Nicaea, I did not think it reasonable, sir, to detain him any longer, because, in the first place, it was still uncertain when your freedman Lycormus would arrive, and then again some indispensable affairs require my presence in a different part of the province. Of this I thought it necessary that you should be informed, because I lately acquainted you in a letter that Lycormus had desired, if any embassy should come this way from Bosporus, that I would detain it till his arrival but i saw no plausible pretext for keeping him back any longer especially as the dispatches from lycormus which as i mentioned before i was not willing to detain would probably reach you some days sooner than this ambassador letter twenty six to the emperor trajan i received a letter sir from apuleius a military man belonging to the garrison at Nicomedia, informing me that one Calidromus, being arrested by Maximus and Dionysius, to bakers to whom he had hired himself, fled for refuge to your statue, that, being brought before a magistrate, he declared he was formerly slave to Liberius Maximus, but being taken prisoner by Susargus in Moesia, he was sent as a present from Decapolis to Pacorus, king of Parthia, in whose service he continued several years from whence he made his escape and came to nicomedia when he was examined before me he confirmed this account for which reason i thought it necessary to send him to you this i should have done sooner but i delayed his journey in order to make an inquiry concerning a seal ring which he said was taken from him upon which was engraven the figure of pacorus in his royal robes i was desirous if it could have been found of transmitting this curiosity to you with a small gold nugget which he says he brought from out of the parthian mines i have affixed my seal to it the impression of which is a chariot drawn by four horses letter twenty seven to the emperor trajan your freedman and procurator Maximus behaved, sir, during all the time we were together, with great probity, attention, and diligence, as one strongly attached to your interest, and strictly observant of discipline. This testimony I willingly give him, and I give it with all the fidelity I owe you. End of section 17 Section 18 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger, translated by William Melmoth, revised by F. C. T. Bosonkay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Correspondence with Trajan. Letters 28 to 51. Letter 28. To the Emperor Trajan. After having experienced, sir, in Gabius Bassus, who commands on the Pontic coast, the greatest integrity, honour, and diligence, as well as the most particular respect to myself. I cannot refuse him my best wishes and suffrage, and I give them to him with all that fidelity which is due to you. I have found him abundantly qualified by having served in the army under you, and it is owing to the advantages of your discipline that he has learned to merit your favour. The soldiery and the people here, who have had full experience of his justice and humanity, rival each other in that glorious testimony they give of his conduct, both in public and in private, and I certify this with all the sincerity you have a right to expect from me. Letter 29. To the Emperor Trajan. Nymphidius Lupus, sir, and myself, served in the army together. He commanded a body of the auxiliary forces at the same time that I was military tribune, and it was from thence my affection for him began. 
A long acquaintance has since mutually endeared and strengthened our friendship. For this reason, I did violence to his repose, and insisted upon his attending me into Bithynia as my assessor in council. He most readily granted me this proof of his friendship, and without any regard to the plea of age, or the ease of retirement, he shared, and continues to share with me, the fatigue of public business. I consider his relations, therefore, as my own, in which number Nymphidius Lupus, his son, claims my particular regard. He is a youth of great merit and indefatigable application, and in every respect well worthy of so excellent a father. The early proof he gave of his merit, when he commanded a regiment of foot, shows him to be equal to any honour you may think proper to confer upon him, and it gained him the strongest testimony of approbation from those most illustrious personages, Julius Ferox and Fuscus Salinator. And I will add, sir, that I shall rejoice in any accession of dignity which he shall receive as an occasion of particular satisfaction to myself. Letter 30. To the Emperor Trajan. I beg your determination, sir, on a point I am exceedingly doubtful about. It is whether I should place the public slaves as sentries round the prisons of the several cities in this province, as has been hitherto the practice or employ a party of soldiers for that purpose. On the one hand, I am afraid the public slaves will not attend this duty with the fidelity they ought, and on the other, that it will engage too large a body of the soldiery. In the meanwhile, I have joined a few of the latter with the former. I am apprehensive, however, there may be some danger that this method will occasion a general neglect of duty as it will afford them a mutual opportunity of throwing the blame upon each other. Letter 31. Trajan to Pliny. There is no occasion, my dearest Secundus, to draw off any soldiers in order to guard the prisons. Let us rather persevere in the ancient customs observed in this province, of employing the public slaves for that purpose and the fidelity with which they shall execute their duty, will depend much upon your care and strict discipline. It is greatly to be feared, as you observe, if the soldiers should be mixed with the public slaves, they will mutually trust to each other, and by that means grow so much the more negligent. But my principal objection is that as few soldiers as possible should be withdrawn from their standard. Letter 32. To the Emperor Trajan. Gabius Bassus, who commands upon the frontiers of Pontica, in a manner suitable to the respect and duty which he owes you, came to me, and has been with me, sir, for several days. As far as I could observe, he is a person of great merit, and worthy of your favour. I acquainted him it was your order that he should retain only ten beneficiary soldiers, two horse-guards, and one centurion out of the troops which you were pleased to assign to my command. He assured me those would not be sufficient, and that he would write to you accordingly, for which reason I thought it proper not immediately to recall his supernumeraries. Letter 33. Trajan to Pliny. I have received from Gabius Bassus the letter you mention, acquainting me that the number of soldiers I had ordered him was not sufficient, and for your information I have directed my answer to be hereunto annexed. It is very material to distinguish between what the exigency of affairs requires, and what an ambitious desire of extending power may think necessary. As for ourselves, the public welfare must be our only guide. Accordingly, it is incumbent upon us to take all possible care that the soldiers shall not be absent from their standard. Letter 34. To the Emperor Trajan. The Prusenses, sir, having an ancient bath which lies in a ruinous state, desire your leave to repair it. But, upon examination, 
I am of opinion it ought to be rebuilt. I think, therefore, you may indulge them in this request, as there will be a sufficient fund for that purpose, partly from those debts which are due from private persons to the public, which I am now collecting in, and partly from what they raise among themselves towards furnishing the bath with oil, which they are willing to apply to the carrying on of this building, a work which the dignity of the city and the splendour of your times seem to demand. Letter 35. Trajan to Pliny. If the erecting a public bath will not be too great a charge upon the Prusenses, we may comply with their request, provided, however, that no new tax be levied for this purpose, nor any of those taken off which are appropriated to Nestri's services. Letter 36. To the Emperor Trajan. I am assured, sir, by your freedman and receiver General Maximus, that it is necessary he should have a party of soldiers assigned to him, over and besides the beneficiari, which, by your orders, I allotted to the very worthy Gemellinus. Those, therefore, which I found in his service, I thought proper he should retain, especially as he was going into Paphlagonia in order to procure corn. For his better protection likewise, and because it was his request, I added two of the cavalry. But I beg you would inform me, in your next dispatches, what method you would have me observe for the future in points of this nature. Letter 37. Trajan to Pliny. As my freedman Maximus was going upon an extraordinary commission to procure corn, I approve of your having supplied him with a file of soldiers. But when he shall return to the duties of his former post, I think two from you, and as many from his coadjutor, my receiver-general Viridius Gemellinus, will be sufficient. Letter 38. To the Emperor Trajan. The very excellent young man Sempronius Caelianus, having discovered two slaves among the recruits, has sent them to me. But I deferred passing sentence till I had consulted you the restorer and upholder of military discipline, concerning the punishment proper to be inflicted upon them. My principal doubt is that, whether, although they have taken the military oath, they are yet entered into any particular legion. I request you, therefore, sir, to inform me what course I should pursue in this affair, especially as it concerns example. Letter 39 Trajan to Pliny. Sempronius Caelianus has acted agreeably to my orders in sending such persons to be tried before you as appear to deserve capital punishment. It is material, however, in the case in question, to inquire whether these slaves enlisted themselves voluntarily, or were chosen by the officers, or presented as substitutes for others. If they were chosen, the officer is guilty. If they are substitutes, the blame rests with those who deputed them. But if, conscious of the legal inabilities of their station, they presented themselves voluntarily, the punishment must fall upon their own heads. That they are not yet entered into any legion makes no great difference in their case for they ought to have given a true account of themselves immediately upon their being approved as fit for the service. Letter 40. To the Emperor Trajan. As I have your permission, sir, to address myself to you in all my doubts, you will not consider it beneath your dignity to descend to those humbler affairs which concern my administration of this province. I find there are in several cities particularly those of Nicomedia and Nicaea, certain persons who take upon themselves to act as public slaves, and receive an annual stipend accordingly. Notwithstanding, they have been condemned either to the mines, the public games, or other punishments of the like nature. Having received information of this abuse, I have been long debating with myself what I ought to do. On the one hand, to send them back again to the respective punishments, 
many of them being now grown old, and behaving, as I am assured, with sobriety and modesty, would, I thought, be proceeding against them too severely. On the other, to retain convicted criminals in the public service seemed not altogether decent. I considered at the same time to support these people in idleness would be an useless expense to the public, and to leave them to starve would be dangerous. I was obliged, therefore, to suspend the determination of this matter till I could consult with you. You will be desirous, perhaps, to be informed how it happened that these persons escaped the punishments to which they were condemned. This inquiry I have also made, but cannot return you any satisfactory answer. The decrees against them were indeed produced, but no record appears of their having ever been reversed. It was asserted, however, that these people were pardoned upon their petition to the proconsuls, or their lieutenants, which seems likely to be the truth, as it is improbable any person would have dared to set them at liberty without authority. Letter 41. Trajan to Pliny. You will remember you were sent into Bithynia for the particular purpose of correcting those many abuses which appeared in need of reform. Now none stands more so than that of criminals who have been sentenced to punishment should not only be set at liberty, as your letter informs me, without authority, but even appointed to employments which ought only to be exercised by persons whose characters are irreproachable. Those therefore among them, who have been convicted within these ten years, and whose sentence has not been reversed by proper authority, must be sent back again to their respective punishments. But where more than ten years have elapsed since their conviction, and they are grown old and infirm, let them be disposed of in such employments as are but few degrees removed from the punishments to which they were sentenced, that is, either to attend upon the public baths, cleanse the common sewers, or repair the streets and highways, the usual offices assigned to such persons. Letter 42. To the Emperor Trajan. While I was making a progress in a different part of the province, a most extensive fire broke out at Nicomedia, which not only consumed several private houses, but also two public buildings, the townhouse and the temple of Isis, though they stood on contrary sides of the street. The occasion of its spreading thus far was partly owing to the violence of the wind, and partly to the indolence of the people, who, manifestly, stood idle and motionless spectators of this terrible calamity. The truth is, the city was not furnished with either engines, buckets, or any single instrument suitable for extinguishing fires, which I have now, however, given directions to have prepared. You will consider, sir, whether it may not be advisable to institute a company of firemen, consisting only of one hundred and fifty members. I will take care none but those of that business shall be admitted into it, and that the privileges granted them shall not be applied to any other purpose, as this corporate body will be restricted to so small a number of members, it will be easy to keep them under proper regulation. Letter 43. Trajan to Pliny. You are of opinion it would be proper to establish a company of farmen in Nicomedia, agreeably to what has been practised in several other cities. But it is to be remembered that societies of this sort have greatly disturbed the peace of the province in general, and of those cities in particular. Whatever name we give them, and for whatever purposes they may be founded, they will not fail to form themselves into factious assemblies, however short their meetings may be. It will therefore be safer to provide such machines as are of service in extinguishing fires, enjoining the owners of houses to assist in preventing the mischief from spreading, and, if it should be necessary, 
to call in the aid of the populace. Letter 44 to the Emperor Trajan We have acquitted, sir, and renewed our annual vows for your prosperity, in which that of the empire is essentially involved imploring the gods to grant us ever thus to pay, and thus to repeat them. Letter 45 Trajan to Pliny I received the satisfaction, my dearest Secundus, of being informed by your letter that you, together with the people under your government, have both discharged and renewed your vows to the immortal gods for my health and happiness. Letter 46 To the Emperor Trajan The citizens of Nicomedia, sir, have expended three millions three hundred and twenty-nine sesterces in building an aqueduct, but, not being able to finish it, the works are entirely falling to ruin. They made a second attempt in another place where they laid out two millions, but this likewise is discontinued, so that, after having been at an immense charge to no purpose, they must still be at a further expense, in order to be accommodated with water. I have examined a fine spring from whence the water may be conveyed over arches, as was attempted in their first design, in such a manner that the higher, as well as level and low parts of the city may be supplied. There are still remaining a very few of the old arches, and the square stones, however, employed in the former building, may be used in turning the new arches. I am of opinion part should be raised with brick, as that will be the easier and cheaper material, but that this work may not meet with the same ill success as the former, it will be necessary to send here an architect or someone skilled in the construction of this kind of waterworks, and I will venture to say, from the beauty and usefulness of the design, it will be an erection well worthy the splendour of your times. Letter 47 Trajan to Pliny Care must be taken to supply the city of Nicomedia with water, and that business, I am well persuaded, you will perform with all the diligence you ought. But really, it is no less incumbent upon you to examine by whose misconduct it has happened that such large sums have been thrown away upon this, lest they apply the money to private purposes. And the aqueduct in question, like the preceding, should be begun, and afterwards left unfinished. You will let me know the result of your inquiry. Letter 48 To the Emperor Trajan The citizens of Nicaea, sir, are building a theatre, which, though it is not yet finished, has already exhausted, as I am informed, for I have not examined the account myself, above ten millions of sesterces, and, what is worse, I fear to no purpose. For either from the foundation being laid in soft marshy ground, or that the stone itself is light and crumbling, the walls are sinking and cracked from top to bottom. It deserves your consideration, therefore, whether it would be best to carry on this work, or entirely discontinue it, or rather, perhaps, whether it would not be most prudent absolutely to destroy it, for the buttresses and foundations by means of which it is from time to time kept up appear to me more expensive than solid. Several private persons have undertaken to build the compartment of this theatre at their own expense, some engaging to erect the portico, others the galleries over the pit, but this design cannot be executed as the principal building which ought first to be completed is now at a stand. This city is also rebuilding, upon a far more enlarged plan, the gymnasium, which was burnt down before my arrival in the province. They have already been at some, and I rather fear a fruitless, expense. The structure is not only irregular and ill-proportioned, 
but the present architect, who it must be owned is a rival to the person who was first employed, asserts that the walls, although twenty-two feet in thickness, are not strong enough to support the superstructure, as the interstices are filled up with quarry stones, and the walls are not overlaid with brickwork. Also the inhabitants of Claudiopolis are sinking, I cannot call it erecting, a large public bath, upon a low spot of ground which lies at the foot of a mountain. The fund appropriated for the carrying on of this work arises from the money which those honorary members you were pleased to add to the Senate paid, or at least are ready to pay whenever I call upon them, for their admission. As I am afraid, therefore, the public money in the city of Nicaea, and, what is infinitely more valuable than any pecuniary consideration, your bounty in that of Nicopolis, should be ill applied. I must desire you to send hither an architect to inspect not only the theatre, but the bath, in order to consider whether, after all the expense which has already been laid out, it will be better to finish them upon the present plan, or alter the one, and remove the other, in as far as may seem necessary, for otherwise we may perhaps throw away our future cost in endeavouring not to lose what we have already expended. Letter 49. Trajan to Pliny. You, who are upon the spot, will best be able to consider and determine what is proper to be done concerning the theatre which the inhabitants of Nicaea are building. As for myself, it will be sufficient if you let me know your determination. With respect to the particular parts of this theatre which are to be raised at a private charge, you will see those engagements fulfilled when the body of the building to which they are to be annexed shall be finished. These paltry Greeks are, I know, immoderately fond of gymnastic diversions, and therefore perhaps the citizens of Nicaea have planned a more magnificent building for this purpose than is necessary. However, they must be content with such as will be sufficient to answer the purpose for which it is intended. I leave it entirely to you to persuade the Claudia Politani as you shall think proper with regard to their bath, which they have placed, it seems, in a very improper situation. As there is no province that is not furnished with men of skill and ingenuity, you cannot possibly want architects, unless you think it the shortest way to procure them from Rome, when it is generally from Greece that they come to us. Letter 50. To the Emperor Trajan. When I reflect upon the splendour of your exalted station and the magnanimity of your spirit, nothing, I am persuaded, can be more suitable to both than to point out to you such works as are worthy of your glorious and immortal name, as being no less useful than magnificent. Bordering upon the territories of the city of Nicomedia is a most extensive lake, of which marbles, fruits, woods, and all kinds of materials, the commodities of the country, are brought over in boats up to the high road, at little trouble and expense, but from thence are conveyed in carriages to the seaside, at a much greater charge, and with great labour. To remedy this inconvenience, many hands will be in request, but upon such an occasion they cannot be wanting, for the country, and particularly the city, is exceedingly populous, and one may assuredly hope that every person will readily engage in a work which will be of universal benefit. It only remains then to send hither, if you shall think proper, a surveyor or an architect, in order to examine whether the lake lies above the level of the sea, the engineers of this province being of opinion that the former is higher by forty cubits. I find there is in the neighbourhood of this place a large canal, which was cut by a king of this country, but as it is left unfinished, it is uncertain whether it was for the purpose of draining the adjacent fields, or making a communication between the lake and the river. 
it is equally doubtful, too, whether the death of the king, or the despair of being able to accomplish the design, prevented the completion of it. If this was the reason, I am so much the more eager and warmly desirous, for the sake of your illustrious character, and I hope you will pardon me the ambition, that you may have the glory of executing what kings could only attempt. Letter 51 Trajan to Pliny There is something in the scheme you propose of opening a communication between the lake and the sea, which may, perhaps, tempt me to consent. But you must first carefully examine the situation of this body of water, what quantity it contains, and from whence it is supplied, lest, by giving it an opening into the sea, it should be totally drained. You may apply to Calpurnius Macca for an engineer, and I will also send you from hence someone skilled in works of this nature. End of section 18section nineteen of letters of pliny by pliny the younger translated by william melmoth revised by f c t bosanquet this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by andrew corman section nineteen letters fifty two to seventy letter fifty two to the emperor trajan upon examining into the public expenses of the city of byzantium which i find are extremely great i was informed sir that the appointments of the ambassador whom they send yearly to you with their homage and the decree which passes in the senate upon that occasion amount to twelve thousand sesterces but knowing the generous maxims of your government i thought proper to send the decree without the ambassador that at the same time they discharge their public duty to you their expense incurred in the manner of paying it might be lightened this city is likewise taxed with the sum of three thousand sesterces towards defraying the expense of an envoy whom they annually send to compliment the governor of moesia this expense i have also directed to be spared i beg sir you would deign either to confirm my judgment or correct my error in these points by acquainting me with your sentiments Letter 53. Trajan to Pliny. I entirely approve, my dearest Secundus, of your having excused the Byzantines that expense of twelve thousand sesterces in sending an ambassador to me. I shall esteem their duty as sufficiently paid, though I only receive the act of their senate through your hands. The governor of Moesia must likewise excuse them if they compliment him at a less expense. Letter 54. To the Emperor Trajan. I beg, sir, you would settle a doubt I have concerning your diplomas, whether you think proper that those diplomas, the dates of which are expired, shall continue in force, and for how long? For I am apprehensive I may, through ignorance, either confirm such of these instruments as are illegal, or prevent the effect of those which are necessary. Letter 55. Trajan to Pliny. The diplomas whose dates are expired must by no means be made use of, for which reason it is an inviolable rule with me to send new instruments of this kind into all the provinces before they are immediately wanted. Letter 56 to the Emperor Trajan. Upon intimating, sir, my intention to the city of Apamea of examining into the state of their public dues, their revenue and expenses, they told me they were all extremely willing I should inspect their accounts, but that no proconsul had ever yet looked them over, as they had a privilege, and that of a very ancient date, of administering the affairs of their corporation in the manner they thought proper. I required them to draw up a memorial of what they then asserted, which I transmit to you precisely as I received it, though I am sensible it contains several things foreign to the question. 
I beg you will deign to instruct me as to how I am to act in this affair, for I should be extremely sorry either to exceed or fall short of the duties of my commission. Letter 57. Trajan to Pliny. The memorial of the Apennines annexed to your letter has saved me the necessity of considering the reasons they suggest why the former proconsuls forbore to inspect their accounts, since they are willing to submit them to your examination. Their honest compliance deserves to be rewarded, and they may be assured the inquiry you are to make in pursuance of my orders shall be with a full reserve to their privileges. Letter 58. To the Emperor Trajan. The Nicomedians, sir, before my arrival in this province, had begun to build a new forum adjoining their former, in a corner of which stands an ancient temple dedicated to the mother of the gods. This fabric must either be repaired or removed, and for this reason chiefly, because it is a much lower building than that very lofty one which is now in process of erection. Upon inquiry whether this temple had been consecrated, I was informed that their ceremonies of dedication differ from ours. You will be pleased, therefore, sir, to consider whether a temple which has not been consecrated according to our rites may be removed, consistently with the reverence due to religion, for, if there should be no objection from that quarter, the removal in every other respect would be extremely convenient. Letter 59. Trajan to Pliny. You may, without scruple, my dearest Secundus, if the situation requires it, remove the temple of the Mother of the Gods, from the place where it now stands, to any other spot more convenient. You need be under no difficulty with respect to the act of dedication, for the ground of a foreign city is not capable of receiving that kind of consecration which is sanctified by our laws. Letter 60. To the Emperor Trajan. We have celebrated, sir, with those sentiments of joy your virtues so justly merit, the day of your accession to the empire, which was also its preservation, imploring the gods to preserve you in health and prosperity. For upon your welfare the security and repose of the world depends. I renewed at the same time the oath of allegiance at the head of the army, which repeated it after me in the usual form, the people of the province zealously concurring in the same oath. Letter 61. Trajan to Pliny. Your letter, my dearest Secundus, was extremely acceptable, as it informed me of the zeal and affection with which you, together with the army and the provincials, solemnized the day of my accession to the empire. Letter 62. To the Emperor Trajan. The debts which we are owing to the public are, by the prudence, sir, of your counsels, and the care of my administration, either actually paid in, or now being collected. But I am afraid the money must lie unemployed. For as on one side there are few or no opportunities of purchasing land, so on the other, one cannot meet with any person who is willing to borrow of the public, especially at twelve per cent interest, when they can raise money upon the same terms from private sources. You will consider then, sir, whether it may not be advisable, in order to invite responsible persons to take this money, to lower the interest, or if that scheme should not succeed, to place it in the hands of the decurie upon their giving sufficient security to the public, and though they should not be willing to receive it, yet as the rate of interest will be diminished, the hardship will be so much the less. Letter 63. Trajan to Pliny. I agree with you, my dear Pliny, that there seems to be no other method of facilitating the placing out of the public money than by lowering the interest, the measure of which you will determine according to the number of the borrowers. But to compel persons to receive it, who are not disposed to do so, when possibly they themselves may have no opportunity of employing it, is by no means consistent with the justice of my government. Letter 64. 
to the Emperor Trajan, I return you my warmest acknowledgments, sir, that, among the many important occupations in which you were engaged, you have condescended to be my guide on those points on which I have consulted you, a favour which I must now again beseech you to grant me. A certain person presented himself with the complaint that his adversaries, who had been banished for three years by the illustrious Servilius Calvus, still remained in the province. They, on the contrary, affirmed that Calvus had revoked their sentence, and produced his edict to that effect. I thought it necessary, therefore, to refer the whole affair to you. For as I have your express orders not to restore any person who has been sentenced to banishment either by myself or others, so I have no directions with respect to those who, having been banished by some of my predecessors in this government, have by them also been restored. It is necessary for me, therefore, to beg you would inform me, sir, how I am to act with regard to the above-mentioned persons as well as others, who, after having been condemned to perpetual banishment, have been found in the province without permission to return. For cases of that nature have likewise fallen under my cognizance. A person was brought before me who had been sentenced to perpetual exile by the proconsul Julius Bassus. But knowing that the acts of Bassus, during his administration, had been rescinded, and that the Senate had granted leave to all those who had fallen under his condemnation of appealing from his decision at any time within the space of two years, I inquired of this man whether he had, accordingly, stated his case to the proconsul. He replied he had not. I beg then you would inform me whether you would have him sent back into exile, or whether you think some more severe, and what kind of punishment should be inflicted upon him and such others who may hereafter be found under the same circumstances. I have annexed to my letter the decree of Calvus, and the edict by which the persons above mentioned were restored, as also the decree of Bassus. Letter 65. Trajan to Pliny. I will let you know my determination concerning those exiles which were banished for three years by the proconsul Publius Servilius Calvus, and soon afterwards restored to the province by his edict, when I shall have informed myself from him of the reasons of this proceeding. With respect to that person who was sentenced to perpetual banishment by Julius Bassus, yet continued to remain in the province, without making his appeal, if he thought himself aggrieved, though he had two years given him for that purpose, I would have sent in chains to my praetorian prefects, for, only to remind him back to a punishment which he has contumaciously eluded, will by no means be a sufficient punishment. Letter 66. To the Emperor Trajan. When I cited the judges, sir, to attend me at a sessions which I was going to hold, Flavius Archippus claimed the privilege of being excused as exercising the profession of a philosopher. It was alleged by some who were present that he ought not only to be excused from that office, but even struck out of the rules of judges, and remanded back to the punishment from which he had escaped by breaking his chains. At the same time a sentence of the proconsul Velius Paulus was read, by which it appeared that Archippus had been condemned to the mines for forgery. He had nothing to produce in proof of this sentence having ever been reversed. He alleged, however, in favour of his restitution, a petition which he presented to Domitian, together with a letter from that prince and a decree of the Prusentians in his honour. To these he subjoined a letter which he had received from you, as also an edict and a letter of your august father confirming the grants which had been made to him by Domitian. For these reasons, notwithstanding crimes of so atrocious a nature were laid to his charge, I did not think proper to determine anything concerning him, without first consulting with you as it is an affair which seems to merit your particular decision. 
I have transmitted to you with this letter the several allegations on both sides. Domitian's letter to Terentius Maximus. Flavius Sarcippus, the philosopher, has prevailed with me to give an order that six hundred thousand sesterces be laid out in the purchase of an estate for the support of him and his family, in the neighbourhood of Prusius, his native country. Let this be accordingly done, and place that sum to the account of my benefactions. From the same to Lucius Appius Maximus. I recommend, my dear Maximus, to your protection that worthy philosopher Archippus, a person whose moral conduct is agreeable to the principles of the philosophy he professes, and I would have you pay entire regard to whatever he shall reasonably request. The Edict of the Emperor Nerva There are some points, no doubt, Quirites, concerning which the happy tenor of my government is a sufficient indication of my sentiments, and a good prince need not give an express declaration in matters wherein his intention cannot but be clearly understood. Every citizen in the empire will bear me witness that I gave up my private repose to the security of the public, and in order that I might have the pleasure of dispensing new bounties of my own as also of confirming those which have been granted by predecessors. But lest the memory of him who conferred these grants, or the diffidence of those who received them, should occasion any interruption to the public joy, I thought it as necessary as it is agreeable to me to obviate these suspicions by assuring them of my indulgence. I do not wish any man who has obtained a private or a public privilege from one of the former emperors to imagine he is to be deprived of such a privilege, merely that he may owe the restoration of it to me. Nor need any who have received the gratifications of imperial favour petition me to have them confirmed. Rather let them leave me at leisure for conferring new grants, under the assurance that I am only to be solicited for those bounties which have not already been obtained, and which the happier fortune of the empire has put it in my power to bestow. From the same to Tullius Justus. Since I have publicly decreed that all acts begun and accomplished in former reigns should be confirmed, the letters of Domitian must remain valid. Letter 67. To the Emperor Trajan. Flavius Archippus has conjured me, by all my vows for your prosperity, and by your immortal glory, that I would transmit to you the memorial which he presented to me. I could not refuse a request couched in such terms. However, I acquainted the prosecutrix with this my intention, from whom I have also received a memorial on her part. I have annexed them both to this letter, that by hearing, as it were, each party, you may the better be enabled to decide. Letter 68. Trajan to Pliny. It is possible that Domitian might have been ignorant of the circumstances in which Archippus was, when he wrote the letter so much to that philosopher's credit. However, it is more agreeable to my disposition to suppose that Prince designed he should be restored to his former situation, especially since he so often had the honour of a statue decreed to him by those who could not be ignorant of the sentence pronounced against him by the proconsul Paulus. But I do not mean to intimate, my dear Pliny, that if any new charge should be brought against him, you should be the less disposed to hear his accusers. I have examined the memorial of his prosecutrix, Furia Prima, as well as that of Archippus himself, which you sent with your last letter. Letter 69. To the Emperor Trajan. The apprehensions you express, sir, that the lake will be in danger of being entirely drained if a communication should be opened between that and the sea by means of the river, are agreeable to that prudence and forethought you so eminently possess. But I think I have found a method to obviate that inconvenience. A channel may be cut from the lake up to the river, so as not quite to join them, leaving just a narrow strip of land between, 
preserving the lake. By this means it will not only be kept quite separate from the river, but all the same purposes will be answered as if they were united, for it will be extremely easy to convey over that little intervening ridge whatever goods shall be brought down by the canal. This is a scheme which may be pursued, if it should be found necessary, but I hope there will be no occasion to have recourse to it, for, in the first place, the lake itself is pretty deep, and in the next, by damming up the river which runs from it on the opposite side, and turning its course as we shall find expedient, the same quantity of water may be retained. Besides, there are several brooks near the place where it is proposed the channel should be cut, which, if skilfully collected, will supply the lake with water in proportion to what it shall discharge. But if you should rather approve of the channels being extended further and cut narrower, and so conveyed directly into the sea, without running into the river, the reflux of the tide will return whatever it receives from the lake. After all, if the nature of the place should not admit of any of these schemes, the course of the water may be checked by sluices. These, however, and many other particulars, will be more skilfully examined into by the engineer, whom indeed, sir, you ought to send, according to your promise, for it is an enterprise well worthy of your attention and magnificence. In the meanwhile, I have written to the illustrious Calpurnius Macker, in pursuance of your orders, to send me the most skilful engineer to be had. Letter 70. Trajan to Pliny. It is evident, my dearest Secundus, that neither your prudence nor your care has been wanting in this affair of the lake, since, in order to render it of more general benefit, you have provided so many expedients against the danger of its being drained. I leave it to your own choice to pursue whichever of the schemes shall be thought most proper. Calpurnius Macca will furnish you, no doubt, with an engineer, as artifices of that kind are not wanting in his province. End of section 19。section 20 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger。Translated by William Melmoth, revised by F. C. T. Bosanquet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Section 20. Letters 71 to 96. Letter 71. To the Emperor Trajan. A very considerable question, sir, in which the whole province is interested, has been lately started concerning the state and maintenance of deserted children. I have examined the constitutions of former princes upon this head, but not finding anything in them relating, either in general or particular, to the Bithynians, I thought it necessary to apply to you for your directions, for in a point which seems to require the special interposition of your authority, I could not content myself with following precedents. An edict of the Emperor Augustus, as pretended, was read to me, concerning one Ania, as also a letter from Vespasian to the Lacedaemonians, and another from Titus to the same, with one likewise from him to the Achaeans, also some letters from Domitian, directed to the proconsuls Avidius Nigrinus and Armenius Brocchus, together with one from that prince to the Lacedaemonians, but I have not transmitted them to you, as they were not correct, and some of them too of doubtful authenticity, and also because I imagine the true copies are preserved in your archives. Letter 72. Trajan to Pliny. The question concerning children who are exposed by their parents, and afterwards preserved by others, and educated in a state of servitude, though born free, has been frequently discussed. But I do not find in the constitutions of the princes my predecessors any general regulation upon this head extending to all the provinces. There are indeed some rescripts of Domitian to Avidius Nigrinus and Armenius Brocchus, which ought to be observed, but Bithynia is not comprehended in the provinces therein mentioned. I am of opinion, therefore, that the claims of those who assert their right of freedom upon this footing should be allowed 
without obliging them to purchase their liberty by repaying the money advanced for their maintenance. Letter 73 to the Emperor Trajan Having been petitioned by some persons to grant them the liberty, agreeably to the practice of former proconsuls, of removing the relics of their deceased relations, upon the suggestion that either their monuments were decayed by age, or ruined by the inundations of the river, or for other reasons of the same kind, I thought proper, sir, knowing that in cases of this nature it is usual at Rome to apply to the College of Priests, to consult you, who are the sovereign of that sacred order, as to how you would have me act in this case. Letter 74. Trajan to Pliny. It will be a hardship upon the provincials to oblige them to address themselves to the college of priests whenever they may have just reasons for removing the ashes of their ancestors. In this case, therefore, it will be better you should follow the example of the governors your predecessors, and grant or deny them this liberty as you shall see reasonable. Letter 75. To the Emperor Trajan. I have inquired, sir, at Prusa, for a proper place on which to erect the bath you were pleased to allow that city to build, and I have found one to my satisfaction. It is upon the site where formerly, I am told, stood a very beautiful mansion, but which is now entirely fallen into ruins. By fixing upon that spot, we shall gain the advantage of ornamenting the city in a part which at present is exceedingly deformed and enlarging it at the same time without removing any of the buildings, only restoring one which is fallen to decay. There are some circumstances attending this structure of which it is proper I should inform you. Claudius Polyinus bequeathed it to the Emperor Claudius Caesar, with directions that a temple should be erected to that prince in a colonnade court, and that the remainder of the house should be let in apartments. The city received the rents for a considerable time, but partly by its having been plundered, and partly by its being neglected, the whole house, colonnade court and all, is entirely gone to ruin, and there is now scarcely anything remaining of it but the ground upon which it stood. If you shall think proper, sir, either to give or sell this spot of ground to the city, as it lies so conveniently for their purpose, they will receive it as a most particular favour. I intend, with your permission, to place the bath in the vacant area, and to extend a range of porticoes with seats in that part where the former edifice stood. This new erection I purpose dedicating to you, by whose bounty it will rise with all the elegance and magnificence worthy of your glorious name have sent you a copy of the will, by which, though it is inaccurate, you will see that Polyinus left several articles of ornament for the embellishment of this house. But these also are lost with all the rest. I will, however, make the strictest inquiry after them that I am able. Letter 76. Trajan to Pliny. I have no objection to the Prusenses making use of the ruined court and house, which you say are untenanted for the erection of their bath, but it is not sufficiently clear by your letter whether the temple in the centre of the colonnade court was actually dedicated to Claudius or not, for if it were, it is still consecrated ground. Letter 77. To the Emperor Trajan. I have been pressed by some persons to take upon myself the inquiry of causes relating to claims of freedom by birthright, agreeably to a rescript of Domitians to Minucius Rufus, and the practice of former proconsuls. But upon casting my eye on the decree of the Senate concerning cases of this nature, I find it only mentions the proconsular provinces. I have therefore, sir, deferred interfering in this affair till I shall receive your instructions as to how you would have me proceed. Letter 78. Trajan to Pliny. If you will send me the decree of the Senate, which occasioned your doubt, I shall be able to judge whether it is proper you should take upon yourself the inquiry of causes relating to claims of freedom by birthright. Letter 79. To the Emperor Trajan. 
Julius Largus of Pontus, a person whom I never saw, nor indeed ever heard his name till lately, in confidence, sir, of your distinguishing judgment in my favour, has entrusted me with the execution of the last instance of his loyalty towards you. He has left me, by his will, his estate upon trust, in the first place to receive out of it fifty thousand sesterces for my own use, and to apply the remainder for the benefits of the cities of Heraclea and Teos, either by erecting some public edifice dedicated to your honour, or instituting athletic games, according as I shall judge proper. These games are to be celebrated every five years, and to be called Trajan's Games. My principal reason for acquainting you with this bequest is that I may receive your directions which of the respective alternatives to choose. Letter 80. Trajan to Pliny. By the prudent choice Julius Largus has made of a trustee, one would imagine he had known you perfectly well. You will consider then what will most tend to perpetuate his memory under the circumstances of the respective cities, and make your option accordingly. Letter 81. To the Emperor Trajan. You acted agreeably, sir, to your usual prudence and foresight in ordering the illustrious Calpurnius Macca to send a legionary centurion to Byzantium. You will consider whether the city of Juliopolis does not deserve the same regard, which, though it is extremely small, sustains very great burthens, and is so much the more exposed to injuries as it is less capable of resisting them. Whatever benefits you shall confer upon that city will in effect be advantageous to the whole country, for it is situated at the entrance of Bithynia, and is the town through which all who travel into this province generally pass. Letter 82. Trajan to Pliny. The circumstances of the city of Byzantium are such, by the great confluence of strangers to it, that I held it incumbent upon me, and consistent with the customs of former reigns, to send thither a legionary centurion's guard to preserve the privileges of that state. But if we should distinguish the city of Juliopolis in the same way, it will be introducing a precedent for many others, whose claim to that favour will rise in proportion to their want of strength. I have so much confidence, however, in your administration as to believe you will omit no method of protecting them from injuries. If any persons shall act contrary to the discipline I have enjoined, let them be instantly corrected or if they happen to be soldiers, and their crimes should be too enormous for immediate chastisement, I would have them sent to their officers, with an account of the particular misdemeanour you shall find they have been guilty of, but if the delinquents should be on their way to Rome, inform me by letter. Letter 83. To the Emperor Trajan. By a law of Pompey's concerning the Bithynians, it is enacted, sir, that no person shall be a magistrate, or be chosen into the senate, under the age of thirty. By the same law it is declared that those who have exercised the office of magistrate are qualified to be members of the senate. Subsequent to this law, the Emperor Augustus published an edict by which it was ordained that persons of the age of twenty-two should be capable of being magistrates. The question, therefore, is whether those who have exercised the functions of a magistrate before the age of thirty may be legally chosen into the Senate by the censors, and if so, whether by the same kind of construction they may be elected senators at the age which entitles them to be magistrates, though they should not actually have borne any office. A custom which, it seems, has hitherto been observed and is said to be expedient, as it is rather better that persons of noble birth should be admitted into the Senate than those of plebeian rank. The censors-elect, having desired my sentiments upon this point, I was of opinion that both by the law of Pompey and the edict of Augustus, those who had exercised the magistracy before the age of thirty might be chosen into the Senate, and for this reason, 
because the edict allows the office of magistrate to be undertaken before thirty, and the law declares that whoever has been a magistrate should be eligible for the senate. But with respect to those who never discharged any office in the state, though they were of the age required for that purpose, I had some doubt, and therefore, sir, I apply to you for your directions. I have subjoined to this letter the heads of the law, together with the edict of Augustus. Letter 84. Trajan to Pliny. I agree with you, my dearest Secundus, in your construction, and am of opinion that the law of Pompey is so far repealed by the edict of the Emperor Augustus, that those persons who are not less than twenty-two years of age may execute the office of magistrates, and when they have, may be received into the senate of their respective cities. But I think that they who are under thirty years of age, and have not discharged the function of a magistrate, cannot, upon pretense that in point of years they were competent to the office, legally be elected into the senate of their several communities. Letter 85. To the Emperor Trajan. Whilst I was dispatching some public affairs, sir, at my apartments in Prusa, at the foot of Olympus, with the intention of leaving that city the same day, the magistrate Asclepiades informed me that Eumolpus had appealed to me from a motion which Cocianus Dion made in their senate. Dion, it seems, having been appointed supervisor of a public building, desired that it might be assigned to the city in form. Eumolpus, who was counsel for Flavius Archippus, insisted that Dion should first be required to deliver in his accounts relating to this work, before it was assigned to the corporation, suggesting that he had not acted in the manner he ought. He added at the same time that in this building, in which your statue is erected, the bodies of Dion's wife and son are entombed and urged me to hear this cause in the public court of judicature. Upon my at once assenting to his request, and deferring my journey for that purpose, he desired a longer day in order to prepare matters for hearing, and that I would try this cause in some other city. I appointed the city of Nicaea, where, when I had taken my seat, the same Eumolpus, pretending not to be yet sufficiently instructed, moved that the trial might be again put off. Dion, on the contrary, insisted it should be heard. They debated this point very fully on both sides, and entered a little into the merits of the cause, when being of opinion that it was reasonable it should be adjourned, and thinking it proper to consult with you in an affair which was of consequence in point of precedent, I directed them to exhibit the articles of the respective allegations in writing for I was desirous you should judge from their own representations of the state of the question between them. Dion promised to comply with this direction, and Eumolpus also assured me he would draw up a memorial of what he had to allege on the part of the community. But he added that, being only concerned as advocate on behalf of Archippus, whose instructions he had laid before me, he had no charge to bring with respect to the sepulchres. Archippus, however, for whom Eumolpus was counsel here, as at Prusa, assured me he would himself present a charge in form upon this head. But neither Eumolpus nor Archippus, though I have waited several days for that purpose, have yet performed their engagement. Dion indeed has, and I have next his memorial to this letter. I have inspected the buildings in question, where I find your statue is placed in a library and as to the edifice in which the bodies of Dion's wife and son are said to be deposited, it stands in the middle of a court, which is enclosed with a colonnade. Deign, therefore, I entreat you, sir, to direct my judgment in the determination of this cause above all others, as it is a point to which the public is greatly attentive, and necessarily so, since the fact is not only acknowledged, but countenanced by many precedents. Letter 86. Trajan to Pliny. You well know, my dearest Secundus, 
that it is my standing maxim not to create an awe of my person by severe and rigorous measures, and by construing every slight offence into an act of treason, you had no reason, therefore, to hesitate a moment upon the point concerning which you thought proper to consult me. Without entering, therefore, into the merits of that question, to which I would by no means give any attention, though there were ever so many instances of the same kind, I recommend to your care the examination of Dion's accounts relating to the public works which he has finished, as it is a case in which the interest of the city is concerned, and as Dion neither ought, nor, it seems, does, refuse to submit to the examination. Letter 87 to the Emperor Trajan the Nicaeans, having, in the name of their community, conjured me, sir, by all my hopes and wishes for your prosperity and immortal glory, an adjuration which is and ought to be most sacred to me, to present to you their petition, I did not think myself at liberty to refuse them, I have therefore annexed it to this letter. Letter 88. Trajan to Pliny. The Nicaeans, I find, claim a right by an edict of Augustus to the estate of every citizen who dies intestate. You will therefore summon the several parties interested in this question, and, examining these pretensions, with the assistance of the procurators Verdius Gemellinus and Epimachus, my freedman, having duly weighed every argument that should be alleged against the claim, determine as shall appear most equitable. Letter 89. To the Emperor Trajan. May this and many succeeding birthdays be attended, sir, with the highest felicity to you, and may you, in the midst of an uninterrupted course of health and prosperity, be still adding to the increase of that immortal glory which your virtues justly merit. Letter 90. Trajan to Pliny. Your wishes, my dearest Secundus, for my enjoyment of many happy birthdays, amidst the glory and prosperity of the Republic, were extremely agreeable to me. Letter 91. To the Emperor Trajan. The inhabitants of Sinope are ill-supplied, sir, with water, which, however, may be brought thither from about sixteen miles' distance in great plenty and perfection. The ground, indeed, near the source of this spring, is, for rather over a mile, of a very suspicious and marshy nature, but I have directed an examination to be made, which will be effected at a small expense, whether it is sufficiently firm to support any superstructure. I have taken care to provide a sufficient fund for this purpose, if you should approve, sir, of a work so conducive to the health and enjoyment of this colony, greatly distressed by a scarcity of water. Letter 92. Trajan to Pliny. I would have you proceed, my dearest Secundus, in carefully examining whether the ground you suspect is firm enough to support an aqueduct for I have no manner of doubt that the Sinopian colony ought to be supplied with water, provided their finances will bear the expense of a work so conducive to their health and pleasure. Letter 93. To the Emperor Trajan. The free and confederate city of the Amiseni enjoys, by your indulgence, the privilege of its own laws, a memorial being presented to me there concerning a charitable institution. I have subjoined it to this letter that you may consider, sir, whether, and how far, this society ought to be licensed or prohibited. Letter 94. Trajan to Pliny. If the petition of the Amiseni which you have transmitted to me, concerning the establishment of a charitable society, be agreeable to their own laws, which by the Articles of Alliance it is stipulated they shall enjoy, I shall not oppose it, especially if these contributions are employed, not for the purpose of riot and faction, but for the support of the indigent. In other cities, however, which are subject to our laws, I would have all assemblies of this nature prohibited. Letter 95. To the Emperor Trajan. Suetonius Tranquillus, sir, 
is a most excellent, honourable, and learned man. I was so much pleased with his tastes and disposition that I have long since invited him into my family, as my constant guest and domestic friend, and my affection for him increased the more I knew of him. Two reasons concur to render the privileges which the law grants to those who have three children particularly necessary to him. I mean the bounty of his friends and the ill success of his marriage. Those advantages, therefore, which nature has denied to him, he hopes to obtain from your goodness by my intercession. I am thoroughly sensible, sir, of the value of the privilege I am asking but I know, too, I am asking it from one whose gracious compliance with all my desires I have amply experienced. How passionately I wish to do so in the present instance, you will judge by my thus requesting it in my absence, which I would not, had it not been a favour which I am more than ordinarily anxious to obtain. Letter 96. Trajan to Pliny. You cannot but be sensible, my dearest Secundus, how reserved I am in granting favours of the kind you desire, having frequently declared in the Senate that I had not exceeded the number of which I assured that illustrious order I would be contented with. I have yielded, however, to your request, and have directed an article to be inserted in my register that I have conferred upon Tranquillus on my usual conditions, the privilege which the law grants to those who have three children. End of section 20。section 21 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger, translated by William Melmoth, revised by F. C. T. Bosanquet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Section 21, Letters 97 and 98. Letter 97. To the Emperor Trajan. It is my invariable rule, sir, to refer to you in all matters where I feel doubtful. For who is more capable of removing my scruples or informing my ignorance? Having never been present at any trials concerning those who profess Christianity, I am unacquainted not only with the nature of their crimes, or the measure of their punishment, but how far it is proper to enter into an examination concerning them. Whether, therefore, any difference is usually made with respect to ages, or no distinction is to be observed between the young and the adult, whether repentance entitles them to a pardon, or if a man has been once a Christian, it avails nothing to desist from his error. Whether the very profession of Christianity, unattended with any criminal act, or only the crimes themselves inherent in the profession, are punishable. On all these points I am in great doubt. In the meanwhile, the method I have observed towards those who have been brought before me as Christians is this. I asked them whether they were Christians. If they admitted it, I repeated the question twice, and threatened them with punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be at once punished, for I was persuaded, whatever the nature of their opinions might be, a contumacious and inflexible obstinacy certainly deserved correction. There were others also brought before me possessed with the same infatuation, but being Roman citizens, I directed them to be sent to Rome. But this crime spreading, as is usually the case, while it was actually under prosecution, several instances of the same nature occurred. An anonymous information was laid before me containing a charge against several persons, who upon examination denied they were Christians, or had ever been so. They repeated after me an invocation to the gods, 
and offered religious rites with wine and incense before your statue, which for that purpose I had ordered to be brought together with those of the gods, and even reviled the name of Christ, whereas there is no forcing, it is said, those who are really Christians into any of these compliances. I thought it proper, therefore, to discharge them. Some among those who were accused by a witness in person at first confessed themselves Christians, but immediately after denied it. The rest owned indeed that they had been of that number formerly, but had now, some above three, others more, and a few above twenty years ago, renounced that error. They all worshipped your statue and the images of the gods, uttering imprecations at the same time against the name of Christ. They affirmed the whole of their guilt, or their error, was that they met on a stated day before it was light, and addressed a form of prayer to Christ as to a divinity, binding themselves by a solemn oath, not for the purposes of any wicked design, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate, and then reassemble to eat in common a harmless meal. From this custom, however, they desisted after the publication of my edict, by which, according to your commands, I forbade the meeting of any assemblies. After receiving this account, I judged it so much the more necessary to endeavour to extort the real truth by putting two female slaves to the torture, who were said to officiate in their religious rites. But all I could discover was evidence of an absurd and extravagant superstition. I deemed it expedient, therefore, to adjourn all further proceedings, in order to consult you, for it appears to be a matter highly deserving your consideration, more especially as great numbers must be involved in the danger of these prosecutions, which have already extended, and are still likely to extend, to persons of all ranks and ages, and even of both sexes. In fact, this contagious superstition is not confined to the cities only, but has spread its infection among the neighbouring villages and country. Nevertheless, it still seems possible to restrain its progress. The temples, at least, which were once almost deserted, begin now to be frequented, and the sacred rites, after a long intermission, are again revived, while there is a general demand for the victims, which till lately found very few purchasers. From all this it is easy to conjecture what numbers might be reclaimed if a general pardon were granted to those who shall repent of their error. Letter 98 Trajan to Pliny. You have adopted the right course, my dearest Secundus, in investigating the charges against the Christians who were brought before you. It is not possible to lay down any general rule for all such cases. Do not go out of your way to look for them. If indeed they should be brought before you, and the crime is proved, they must be punished with the restriction, however, that where the party denies he is a Christian, and shall make it evident that he is not, by invoking our gods, let him, notwithstanding any former suspicion, be pardoned upon his repentance. Anonymous informations ought not to be received in any sort of prosecution. It is introducing a very dangerous precedent, and is quite foreign to the spirit of our age. End of section 21
Section 22 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger Translated by William Melmoth Revised by F.C.T. Bosenkay This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman Section 22 Letters 99 to 122 Letter 99 to the Emperor Trajan The elegant and beautiful city of Amastris, sir, has among other principal constructions a very fine street and of considerable length on one entire side of which runs what is called indeed a river but in fact is no other than a vile common sewer extremely offensive to the eye and at the same time very pestilential on account of its noxious smell it will be advantageous therefore in point of health as well as decency, to have it covered, which shall be done with your permission, as I will take care on my part that money be not wanting for executing so noble and necessary a work. Letter 100. Trajan to Pliny. It is highly reasonable, my dearest Secundus, if the water which runs through the city of Amastris is prejudicial while uncovered, to the health of the inhabitants, that it should be covered up. I am well assured you will, with your usual application, take care that the money necessary for this work shall not be wanting. Letter 101 to the Emperor Trajan We have celebrated, sir, with great joy and festivity, those votive solemnities which were publicly proclaimed as formerly, and renewed them the present year, accompanied by the soldiers and provincials, who zealously joined with us in imploring the gods that they would be graciously pleased to preserve you and the Republic in that state of prosperity which your many and great virtues, particularly your piety and reverence towards them, so justly merit. Letter 102. Trajan to Pliny. It was agreeable to me to learn by your letter that the army and the provincials seconded you, with the most joyful unanimity, in those vows which you paid and renewed to the immortal gods for my preservation and prosperity. Letter 103. To the Emperor Trajan. We have celebrated with all the warmth of that pious zeal we justly ought the day on which, by a most happy succession, the protection of mankind was committed over into your hands, recommending to the gods, from whom you received the empire, the object of your public vows and congratulations. Letter 104. Trajan to Pliny. I was extremely well pleased to be informed by your letter that you had, at the head of the soldiers and the provincials, solemnized my accession to the empire with all due joy and zeal. Letter 105 to the Emperor Trajan. Valerius Paulinus, sir, having bequeathed to me the right of patronage over all his freedmen, except one, I entreat you to grant the freedom of Rome to three of them. To desire you to extend this favour to all of them would, I fear, be too unreasonable a trespass upon your indulgence, which, in proportion as I have amply experienced, I ought to be so much the more cautious in troubling. The persons for whom I make this request are Caius Valerius Astrius, Caius Valerius Dionysius, and Caius Valerius Appa. Letter 106. Trajan to Pliny. You act most generously in so early soliciting in favour of those whom Valerius Paulinus has confided to your trust, I have accordingly granted the freedom of the city to such of his freedmen for whom you requested it, and have directed the patent to be registered. I am ready to confer the same on the rest, whenever you shall desire me. Letter 107. To the Emperor Trajan. Publius Attius Aquila, a centurion of the sixth equestrian cohort, requested me, sir, to transmit his petition to you in favour of his daughter. I thought it would be unkind to refuse him this service, knowing, as I do, with what patience and kindness you attend to the petitions of the soldiers. Letter 108. Trajan to Pliny. 
I have read the petition of Publius Attius Aquila, centurion of the sixth equestrian cohort, which you sent to me, and in compliance with his request, I have conferred upon his daughter the freedom of the city of Rome. I send you at the same time the patent, which you will deliver to him. Letter 109 to the Emperor Trajan. I request, sir, your directions with respect to the recovering those debts which are due to the cities of Bithynia and Pontus, either for rent or goods sold, or upon any other consideration. I find they have a privilege conceded to them by several proconsuls of being preferred to other creditors, and this custom has prevailed as if it had been established by law. Your prudence, I imagine, will think it necessary to enact some settled rule by which their rights may always be secured. For the edicts of others, how wisely, however founded, are but feeble and temporary ordinances, unless confirmed and sanctioned by your authority. Letter 110. Trajan to Pliny. The right which the cities either of Pontus or Bithynia claim relating to the recovery of debts of whatever kind, due to their several communities, must be determined agreeably to the respective laws. Where any of these communities enjoy the privilege of being preferred to other creditors, it must be maintained. But where no such privilege prevails, it is not just I should establish one in prejudice of private property. Letter 111 to the Emperor Trajan. The solicitor to the treasury of the city of Amasis instituted a claim, sir, before me against Julius Piso of about forty thousand denarii, presented to him by the public above twenty years ago, with the consent of the general council and assembly of the city, and he founded his demand upon certain of your edicts, by which donations of this kind are prohibited. Piso, on the other hand, asserted that he had conferred large sums of money upon the community, and indeed had thereby expended almost the whole of his estate. He insisted upon the length of time which had intervened since this donation, and hoped that he should not be compelled, to the ruin of the remainder of his fortunes, to refund a present which had been granted him long since, in return for many good offices he had done the city. For this reason, sir, I thought it necessary to suspend giving any judgment in this cause till I shall receive your directions. Letter 112, Trajan to Pliny. Though by my edicts I have ordained that no largesses shall be given out of the public money, yet that numberless private persons may not be disturbed in the secure possession of their fortunes, those donations which have been made long since ought not to be called in question or revoked. We will not therefore inquire into anything that has been transacted in this affair so long ago as twenty years, for I would be no less attentive to secure the repose of every private man than to preserve the treasure of every public community. Letter 113 to the Emperor Trajan. The Pompeian law, sir, which is observed in Pontus and Bithynia, does not direct that any money for their admission shall be paid in by those who are elected into the Senate by the censors. It has, however, been usual for such members as have been admitted into those assemblies, in pursuance of the privilege which you were pleased to grant to some particular cities, of receiving above their legal number, to pay one or two thousand denarii on their election. Subsequent to this, the proconsul Anicius Maximus ordained, though indeed his edict related to some few cities only, that those who were elected by the censors should also pay into the treasury a certain sum, which varied in different places. It remains, therefore, for your consideration whether it would not be proper to settle a certain sum for each member who is elected into the councils to pay upon his entrance, for it well becomes you, whose every word and action deserves to be immortalized, 
to establish laws that shall endure for ever. Letter 114. Trajan to Pliny. I can give no general directions applicable to all the cities of Bithynia in relation to those who are elected members of their respective councils, whether they shall pay an honorary fee upon their admittance or not. I think that the safest method which can be pursued is to follow the particular laws of each city, and I also think that the censors ought to make the sum less for those who are chosen into the senate contrary to their inclinations than for the rest. Letter 115. To the Emperor Trajan. The Pompeian law, sir, allows the Bithynians to give the freedom of their respective cities to any person they think proper, provided he is not a foreigner, but native of some of the cities of this province. The same law specifies the particular causes for which the censors may expel any member of the Senate, but makes no mention of foreigners. Certain of the censors, therefore, have desired my opinion whether they ought to expel a member if he should happen to be a foreigner. But I thought it necessary to receive your instructions in this case, not only because the law, though it forbids foreigners to be admitted citizens, does not direct that a senator shall be expelled for the same reason, but because I am informed that in every city in the province a great number of the senators are foreigners. If, therefore, this clause of the law, which seems to be antiquated by a long custom to the contrary, should be enforced, many cities, as well as private persons, must be injured by it. I have annexed the heads of this law to my letter. Letter 116. Trajan to Pliny. You might well be doubtful, my dearest Secundus, what reply to give to the censors who consulted you concerning their right to elect into the Senate foreign citizens, though of the same province. The authority of the law on one side, and long custom prevailing against it on the other, might justly occasion you to hesitate. The proper mean to observe in this case will be to make no change in what is past, but to allow those senators who are already elected, though contrary to law, to keep their seats, to whatever city they may belong. In all future elections, however, to pursue the directions of the Pompeian law, for to give it a retrospective operation would necessarily introduce great confusion. Letter 117 to the Emperor Trajan It is customary here upon any person taking the manly robe, solemnizing his marriage, entering upon the office of a magistrate, or dedicating any public work, to invite the whole senate, together with a considerable part of the commonalty, and distribute to each of the company one or two denarii. I request you to inform me whether you think proper this ceremony should be observed, or how far you approve of it. For myself, though I am of opinion that upon some occasions, especially those of public festivals, this kind of invitation may be permitted, yet, when carried so far as to draw together a thousand persons, and sometimes more, it seems to be going beyond a reasonable number, and has somewhat the appearance of ambitious largesses. Letter 118. Trajan to Pliny. You very justly apprehended that those public invitations which extend to an immoderate number of people, and where the dole is distributed, not singly to a few acquaintances, but, as it were, to whole collective bodies, may be turned to the factious purposes of ambition. But I appointed you to your present government, fully relying upon your prudence, and in the persuasion that you would take proper measures for regulating the manners and settling the peace of the province. Letter 119. To the Emperor Trajan. The athletic victors, sir, 
in the Isolastic Games, conceive that the stipend you have established for the conquerors becomes due from the day they are crowned. For it is not at all material, they say, what time they were triumphantly conducted into their country, but when they merited that honour. On the contrary, when I consider the meaning of the term Isolastic, I am strongly inclined to think that it is intended the stipend should commence from the time of their public entry. They likewise petition to be allowed the treat you give at those combats which you have converted into Isolastic, though they were conquerors before the appointment of that institution, for it is but reasonable, they assert, that they should receive the reward in this instance, as they are deprived of it at those games which have been divested of the honour of being isolastic since their victory. But I am very doubtful whether a retrospect should be admitted in the case in question, and a reward given, to which the claimants had no right at the time they obtained the victory. I beg, therefore, you would be pleased to direct my judgment in these points, by explaining the intention of your own benefactions. Letter 120. Trajan to Pliny. The stipend appointed for the conqueror in the Isolastic Games ought not, I think, to commence till he makes his triumphant entry into his city, nor are the prizes at those combats which I thought proper to make Isolastic, to be extended backwards to those who were victors before that alteration took place. With regard to the plea which these athletic competents urge, that they ought to receive the Isolastic prize at those combats which have been made Isolastic subsequent to their conquests, as they are denied it in the same case where the games have ceased to be so, it proves nothing in their favour for notwithstanding any new arrangements which has been made relating to these games, they are not called upon to return the recompense which they received prior to such alteration. Letter 121. To the Emperor Trajan. I have hitherto never, sir, granted an order for post-chaises to any person, or upon any occasion, but in affairs that relate to your administration. I find myself, however, at present under a sort of necessity of breaking through this fixed rule. My wife, having received an account of her grandfather's death, and being desirous to wait upon her aunt with all possible expedition, I thought it would be unkind to deny her the use of this privilege, as the grace of so tender an office consists in the early discharge of it and as I well knew a journey which was founded in filial piety could not fail of your approbation. I should think myself highly ungrateful, therefore, were I not to acknowledge that, among other great obligations which I owe to your indulgence, I have this in particular, that, in confidence of your favour, I have ventured to do, without consulting you, what would have been too late, had I waited for your consent. Letter 122. Trajan to Pliny. You did me justice, my dearest Secundus, in confiding in my affection towards you. Without doubt, if you had waited for my consent to forward your wife in her journey by means of those warrants which I have entrusted to your care, the use of them would not have answered your purpose, since it was proper this visit to her aunt should have the additional recommendation of being paid with all possible expedition. End of section 22 End of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger Translated by William Melmoth Revised by F. C. T. Bosanquet